Hello everyone, welcome to the 7th annual Islamic Art Festival that is happening today. My name is Nizar Meknoja, I'm an artist, Assalamu Alaikum. I'm so happy to be here uh, and very excited as the festival is going on online. Um, I would suggest you guys check it out, the Islamic Art Festival 2020. Um, I've been with Islamic Art Society since last uh, seven years, uh, from the beginning of course. In the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Harim Tahir. On behalf of Islamic Art Society, I welcome you to the 7th Annual Islamic Arts Festival. This year, we are bringing our annual festival to you in a manner that keeps you safe from the pandemic. We have wonderful programming lined up for you for the next two days. Sit back and enjoy. Let's start with an opening ceremony for the festival at the Houston City Hall, organized by the Mayor Sylvester Turner's office. <laughs>
Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to be introducing the opening ceremony of 7th annual Arts Festival. This year, brought to you in a safe manner on your computer and right there on your phone. Today we are here at the Houston City Hall to officially open the festival. Some of our host committee members are with us. Some are at other locations and we will be bringing them to you during this live streaming. Islamic arts not only tie together various Muslim cultures, backgrounds, languages, ethnicities, sects and other aspects in the greater Houston area, but Islamic Art Society also provides a medium for the entire Muslim community to present itself to the larger American community with bright colors, intricate and historical themes, complex motifs, awesome calligraphy and so forth. It makes people look at Islam as an amazing addition to American life. It makes immersion of various Muslim communities in American mainstream a pleasant and soothing experience. My dear friend, Mayor Sylvester Turner has always been supportive of Islamic Art Society and City of Houston is committed to holding this festival as Islamic Arts Convention. We are working on it with Houston First Corporation to achieve this as soon as we are out of pandemic, inshallah, next year. The person heading this festival this year as the honorary host committee chair is no stranger to us. Mayor of Houston, Sylvester Turner, is our friend. He remembers his friends and also cherishes causes dear to them. It took him no time to agree to a splash of Islamic arts at the City Hall in 2017. Yes, on 4th of July 2017, City Hall was decked out in Islamic arts. And yes, it was the bravery of the City Hall employees who saved the art hung in the tunnels during Harvey. On 8th of March this year, Mayor Turner headed the first gala of Islamic Art Society right before we shut down. That gala put Islamic Art Society on Houston's map. Now here we are with technology-based festival, with 3D gallery, presentations, classes, and other activities over the next two days. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our friend, Mayor of Houston, the Honorable Sylvester Turner, to officially open this festival. Thank you, Zaf. Look, it is my pleasure to help open the 7th Islamic Arts Festival. While it is virtual this year, even in this virtual environment, we can keep the amazing art front and center. I want to thank all of those that have made not only this event, but our showcasing of Islamic art possible. First, let me thank the Islamic Art Society of Houston for bringing together the Muslim American community of Greater Houston and all of our communities of Houston to celebrate this beautiful art. From the artwork I saw in Istanbul and Bahrain, to what we see in the many mosques and museums in Houston, to what is displayed around me this evening, the array of colors and images are simply amazing. In 2017, the city hosted the first exhibit of Islamic art at City Hall. More than 60 artworks by Houston artists graced the rotunda, the underground gallery, and the annex. It was an ambitious undertaking by the Islamic Art Society and was one of the most popular exhibitions we have had to this day. In Houston, we have brought the vibrancy and diversity of the Islamic lands right here to the Bayou City. Thanks to our diversity and the global nature of Houstonians, we have amongst us those that excel in creating world-class Islamic art. We are a city that cherishes the arts from all over the world. It is what makes us a world-class global hub for not only businesses, but for art and culture. I want again to commend the Islamic Art Society of Houston for creating the opportunity for artists to showcase their work to a broad Houston and global audience, even during these challenging times. Ladies and gentlemen, Fort Bend is part and parcel of Greater Houston area and of the Muslim community. In fact, Fort Bend is now a hub of Muslim population, which is a part of the fastest growing diverse county in the country. The recent elections in Fort Bend County are a testimony of that. The district attorney of the county is my dear friend and friend of the community, extremely popular, an elected official already known for his commitment and achievements. 
Islamic Art Society is honored to have Honorable Brian Middleton, the DA of Fort Bend County here to participate in the formal opening of the festival. Hi, I'm Brian Middleton, Fort Bend County District Attorney. First of all, I'd like to thank the Islamic Art Society for allowing me to be a part of the honorary host committee for this year's Islamic Arts Festival. If you're like me, I always say, I don't want to feel good, I want to feel God. And so when I go, whenever I go to the Islamic Arts Festival, I'm always inspired by the different art pieces that are typically an expression of spirituality. So I always have a great time looking at the different art pieces and seeing all the different expressions from the different artists. So I hope you will join and participate in this year's virtual arts festival. And I hope you will see the same things that I see in these art pieces. You know, Fort Bend County is one of the most diverse counties in the nation. And I'm proud to be from a community that is very diverse and includes a lot of Muslims. So I want to again thank the Islamic Art Society for allowing me to participate in this wonderful event. And I encourage our viewers to partake in these beautiful expressions of the spirituality. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you host committee member who prefers to work behind the scene. My dear friend and a successful businessman, Mr. Ayaz Nasser. Mr. Nasser is a philanthropist and committed supporter of all Muslim community activities and efforts. He played a key role in supporting our gala in March and is committed to making it an Islamic arts convention. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Mr. Ayaz Nasser. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the beneficent, the merciful. Thank you, Zafar, for the introduction. My name is Ayaz Nasser, and I'm very pleased to be part of this uh, event, the seventh gala that we'll be hosting this year. Uh, it's a great honor and a privilege to be part of it. I first came in contact with this uh, fine organization at the last ISNA conference uh, when I walked over to the George R. Brown Convention Center and uh, uh, I was introduced to the organizers uh, that took us around and it was a fascinating visit. Uh, to see the phenomenal art that came from the Islamic world. I must say, uh, my good friend Musa Dakri, who was along with me and myself, was so awed that we felt this truly was an incredible undertaking. We found the organizers, Zaf Tahir and, and Dr. Azimuddin, that had such a great vision for this organization, a vision with a good purpose and a wonderful way to build bridges between the Islamic community here and the world at large. Uh, it was truly a great undertaking and uh, having also uh, seen the large congregation of people from the various Islamic, the 56 Islamic countries around the world participating in this event was truly uh, a wonderful uh, moment. Uh, I wish them the best in their endeavors. Uh, I think they've done a phenomenal work for the future and we look forward to the success of this. Ladies and gentlemen, now we go to some of our speakers who will be live streaming from other locations because of COVID. First one I have is Honorable Ambassador Sada Kumber, who will be speaking from his home office surrounded by wonderful Islamic art. Uh, Ambassador Kumber is an Islamic art connoisseur and a collector, a supporter of Islamic Art Society. Ambassador Kumber was the first Muslim American ambassador to represent the United States at OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries. Ladies and gentlemen, here is Ambassador Sada Kumber. Good evening. Thank you for overwhelmingly supporting and attending the Islamic Art Festival. I want to thank the entire board leadership of Islamic Arts Festival for inviting me to make remarks for this very special event. As COVID-19 has made us all realize to function and alter our lifestyle, which in many ways have gotten us to become actually more creative in affairs like today's event, in which we not only are able to participate and enjoy viewing several art pieces presented by our talented artists, but also able to participate in auction and purchase of the art. 
This mashallah is seventh year of most successful annual festivals. And I want to thank Houston's civic, diplomatic, academic, and community leadership for their support and participation. Islamic art goes back 14 centuries and it has never been exclusive use for the followers of Islam only. In fact, Islamic art is a vital part of humanity's shared values and culture recognized throughout the world for its aesthetic and originality. Islamic art today is globally appreciated and with all its merit, keenly collected, handsomely displayed and proudly showcased. Use of calligraphy, textile, ceramic, music, scores of other disciplines are an integral part of Islamic art that we all enjoy today. For example, in South Asia, we see Persian and Urdu beauty so beautifully overlapped into Hindu ragas, which then turn into soothing music that we all thoroughly enjoy. Same goes for different textile, ceramic, used by caliphs and gifts for visiting dignitaries. Today, we have an excellent opportunity and I encourage young artists who have specialized in Islamic art that we should recognize them and I strongly feel that we virtually visit their booths, acquired their work and generosity, excellent work and just proudly display at our homes and place of work. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I now present to you a host committee member who is one of the most active and influential Muslim leaders in the Houston area. My dear friend Masood Baba is the chairman of Al Farooq Foundation and has been an ardent supporter of Islamic Art Society. He played a key and supportive role for our gala in March and is committed to making it an Islamic arts convention. I present to you Mr. Masood Baba. Thank you, Zab. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to welcome all of you to the seventh Islamic Art Festival organized by Islamic Art Society. I'm pleased and honored to be part of the honorary host committee for the festival this year. And yes, Zab. It was indeed an honor to host and support the wonderful gala chaired by our Honorable Mayor Turner and Marsh. That gala truly put Islamic art on the Houston scene. Islamic Art Society is doing a great service by bringing all Muslim cultures together on the form of arts and allowing our American friends to see the hidden beauty and the intricate design the geometries of layouts and amazing combination of colors and theme. This is the side of Islam that is unfortunately missing from our media focus on Islam and Muslim. I take pride in being part of movement, this Islamic arts in Houston. On behalf of the host committee, I appreciate Mayor of Houston, the Honorable Mayor Turner, for hosting us today at the City Hall for this opening ceremony. I also want to acknowledge the presence today and participation as a host by the District Attorney of Fort Bend County, the Honorable Brian Middleton. I welcome all of you to this festival, which will extend over the next two days. Yes, it is all online, but that is to ensure your safety as we fight this pandemic. Inshallah next year, once we are out of this pandemic, we are committed to bring you this arts festival as Islamic art convention in downtown Houston. Thanks to the backing and support of the city and our great mayor, please rest assured that experience will be rich as what you expect from Islamic art society. Please do take advantage of not only our art gallery, but our classes and presentations. Welcome. Now, in the end, it gives me great pleasure to invite the person who had the vision and perseverance to make it a reality. Yes, Islamic Art Society is a brainchild of Dr. Khwaja Azimuddin. Dr. Azimuddin is not only an accomplished surgeon, but an avid artist himself. What you see today is what has transpired over the last seven years in countless hours, limitless work, unending energy of the chairman 
of Islamic Art Society. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Dr. Khwaja Azimuddin. Ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you to the 7th Annual Islamic Arts Festival and the first ever online Islamic Arts Festival. Since its inception, the Islamic Arts Festival has become an iconic event in the Houston culture map. Each year, we have attracted over 5,000 people and brought joy and beauty into their lives. People from all walks of life, young and old, Muslims and non-Muslims, converge at our festival every year to experience the beauty of Islamic arts. When COVID hit, we were saddened about its impact on human lives and livelihood. But we were also saddened by the fact that we would not be able to hold our beloved annual Islamic Arts Festival in person, as had been our tradition for the past many years. Our Arts Festival had always been a place for people to come together and experience the common connections between arts and culture. It had provided opportunities for people of diverse background to mingle and learn about each other during the two days of fun and festivity. And we just did not want to let go of this great opportunity. However, out of abundance of precaution and for the need of social distancing, we decided very early on that we would not be doing an in-person event. So we started planning for this online festival. There is a saying that there is a blessing in every hardship. And as we started planning our online festival, we realized that new doors were opening up and we had so many more opportunities. We are now able to attract artists and visitors, not only from Houston and surrounding areas, but also from all over America and Canada. And with this blessing, we began planning for the festival. Over the next two days, you will see beautiful examples of Islamic art. You would be able to walk through our online galleries where you can buy art from the comfort of your homes. You will see art performances, live workshops, children's art activities, and panel discussions on Islamic art by world-renowned experts in this field. We have gathered an excellent program for the next two days, and I hope you will enjoy every minute. So join us online on our website, on our Facebook page, and Instagram pages, and bring your friends and family along for the most wonderful experience. Thank you. As you just witnessed, the Houston City Hall has been a hub of activity for Islamic Art Society for the past three years, and this year it was no different. IAS is thankful to the various departments for putting this together. Mayor Sylvester Turner and his staff, Mr. Andy Eichen, Chief Development Officer, Mr. Chris Olson, Director of Trade and, and International Affairs, Mayor's Office of Culture Affairs led by Ms. Debbie McNulty, Ms. Mary Benton, Communications Director, Ms. Ada Ortega, Press Secretary. The program was recorded and produced by HTV team, Mr. Ted Iring, Mr. Daryl Hughes, Mr. Keith Jackson. The program was edited for presentation by Mr. Zeeshan Jaffrey of CJ Productions. My name is Mansur Pohan. Uh, my name is Fee Kenya Mahanga. My name is Innocent. Um, Bugingo. I have a special immigrant visa from Afghanistan. From Congo. I'm Congolese. And I was eligible to apply for special immigrant visa. And when I came, I was a refugee. I was welcomed by RSD and they supported me at the beginning and they welcomed me at the airport. When I got here, I found that everything in the apartment was set up, you know, like from refugee camp to like to United States, it was like a miracle. They was the one that helping us with everything, like right? applying for me food stamp, uh, house, and it was wonderful. What has been a really big success for you since you came? So when I came, um, I I was in middle school. We were walking outside, going home, and then I saw girls running outside. I'm like, is that a sport? Can girls do that? So I started doing track and cross country when I was in high school and then luckily I got a scholarship to a college so now I'm like the first person in my family who graduated from university. 
having like a permanent job, wife. I got married. Oh, that's the was <laughs> number one success. Whenever I go home and I see my kids are happy, they are happy, and my wife is happy. What is your hope for people to know about other refugees coming? A lot of refugees are educated, and they really, really want to learn a lot. There is only one way you can like. Have hope once getting here, just working hard. My hope is for the people to help as much as they can. You know, like becoming as refugees is not like always a first choice. They need the uh, community support. Is there anything else you want to say? No. Welcome to the 7th Annual Islamic Art Festival that is happening today. My name is Nizar Meknoja. I'm an artist. Assalamu alaikum. I'm so happy to be here uh, and very excited as the festival is going on online. Um, I would suggest you guys check it out. Islamic Art Festival 2020. Um, I've been with Islamic Art Society since last uh, seven years. Uh, from the beginning, of course, the first exhibition they did was in 2014. Um, can't believe it's been almost seven years now. And Islamic Art Society um, has grown a lot. Um, they have requested uh, me to uh, do this live demo for you guys today. And here I am. Uh, before any delay, let's get started. So what I'm going to do is that I already have a sketch uh, of Sufi. I'm not sure if you guys can see or not. Because of the not enough time, uh, I've already sketched out what I want to paint. done is use the acrylic ink and lots of water 
just so the paint would drip. And now we begin the painting process where I'm gonna start using the, the acrylic paint.
Selamünaleyküm. Uh, I'm Nazlı Çizmeci, uh, Ebru or Water Marbling Artist with Islamic Art Society. Today we would like to show you uh, how to make Ebru.
Storytelling is a form of communication that speaks to both mind and heart. It is an age-old expression and narration of life's laughs, loves, and mysteries. Every culture has used tales, fables, legends, and epics as a method of describing or teaching about what is enduring in the events and conditions of what it means to be human. Storytelling's beauty is how each individual culture embroiders and colors its tales. It simultaneously unfolds its universal theme. Storytelling is a banquet where all are invited and none leave hungry. For decades, storytelling artist Benjamin Van Houten has delighted a wide range of audiences with his unique and unusual repertoire of tales from the world of Islam. In addition to being rich and entertaining, this program addresses the need to introduce audiences to an important and often misunderstood faith and the need to promote understanding of the many diverse cultures represented within the world of Islam. So, enjoy traveling around the world with us on our narrative caravan. Once in the far land of Western China, there was a farmer and this farmer owned a small farm and on one of his fields, he had a beautiful, beautiful stallion. And this stallion was worth <clears throat> everything to him because it would take <clears throat> his car to town. It would help him plow his fields. It would help him carry loads for him. <clears throat> but one day <clears throat> there was a thunderstorm and the thunderstorm came over and there was a big, big thunderclap and the stallion had reared up <clears throat> and it broke through the fence that surrounded the paddock and it ran off across the steps into the mountains. And the neighbor, he came out and he saw the stallion running across the steps towards the mountains and he came up to the farmer and said, ah, <clears throat> what a terrible thing. Look at this, this stallion, you rely on it for everything and now it's gone. What will you do? And the farmer looked at him and says, <clears throat> I don't know for better or for worse, but mashallah, that's the way Allah willed it, mashallah. Well, the day went by and the next day came and late in the afternoon at the next day, <clears throat> lo and behold, there, out of the mountains came the stallion. And it wasn't alone. <clears throat> it had brought with him a wild mare and it led the mare into the paddock and there the farmer came and he fixed the fence around the paddock, around the pasture. And there suddenly there was two horses 
or the stallion and the mare. And the, <clears throat> and the neighbor came out and says, Ah, what a lucky man you are. Look at you. You have two horses now. If you tame that mare, you'll be able to do twice the work. You will be able to <clears throat> plow twice the fields and you will be able to take twice the load to town. What a lucky man you are. And the farmer looked at him and says, I don't know if it's for better or for worse. But that's the way Allah willed it, mashallah. Well, the next day it happened that the son of the farmer, <clears throat> he tried to break the mare. And as he was trying to break the mare and rode it, suddenly he was thrown off. And his leg was terribly broken in several places. The neighbor came out to the farmer and says, look at this. What a terrible thing for your son. His leg is broken. This is going to take a long, long time to heal and you won't have any help. What a terrible thing. The farmer looked at him and said, I don't know if it's for better or for worse, but mashallah, that's the way Allah willed it, mashallah. Well, it just so happened that a week later, <clears throat> messengers came from the king of that land and they were rounding up all the young men to bring them to the army, to bring them to battle. <clears throat> and as <clears throat> the farmer and his neighbor stood there watching the neighbor's son being taken by the messengers to the army, the neighbor turned to, his, <clears throat> to this, his neighbor, the farmer, and said, Oh, you're a lucky man. Your son's a lucky man. Look at him. His leg is broken in so many places that even the army won't take him. <clears throat> you're a lucky man. And the farmer looked at him and says, I don't know if it's for better or for worse, but that's the way I wanted it. Mashallah. And this story goes on and on and on, and you can take from it what you will. Once there was a stone cutter, and this stone cutter worked very, very hard, cutting stone, chopping stone, and for little pay, and he was not contented. And day after day after day, he did his heavy labor working, cutting stone. And he wished one day, <clears throat> as he saw a rich man passing by, he said, Ah, I wish I was a rich man. I wish I could sit like him. <clears throat> in my room and have servants fan me so I can relax. And an angel from the heavens passed by and heard him and came to him and said, it will be as you wish. And suddenly there he was. He sat in this room, he was a rich man. And the servant stood by and with palm fronts, they cooled him down as he sat there. And he sat there for several days until one day the king of that country came by. And there, as he rode in his palaquin, and he was, there were servants before him, there were soldiers behind him. And he looked at the king of that country and he says, MashaAllah, look at that. This is a king. Ah, his heart was not contented. And he said, look, he has servants before him, soldiers behind him. He's being carried around. Ah, I wish I was the king. And the angel came and it heard him and said, okay, you will be a king. And there suddenly he was, he was the king. And he was being carried and there were servants before him and soldiers behind him. <clears throat> and he sat there as the king in the courtyard, <clears throat> looking, wait, receiving his people. He sat there under the palaquin and it was a beautiful sunny day. And as he sat there, the sun started beaming down on him and it became hotter and hotter and hotter. And suddenly he started sweating and he was not contented anymore as he looked up because there he looked and said look there is one that mightier than I it's the Sun I wish to be the Sun well the angel came down from the heavens and said you will be the Sun and there he was he was the Sun he was there in the sky beaming down on all the world and he was drying up the waters he was shriveling the plants and everything sought shade under the trees. <clears throat> and he was burning the trees up. People sought shade in their houses. Everybody fled before the might of his burning might of the sun. Until suddenly, a storm cloud floated in through the heavens. And where the storm cloud was, his rays did not reach. And green grasses started growing again. And the cloud grew and grew and grew. And more and more grasses, 
and it started raining and the clouds started raining and raining and raining and wherever it grew more and more greenery came up and his rays did not reach and he looked down at that cloud and said ah look at that there is one that is mightier than I I wish to be that strong cloud well there he was the angel came down from the heavens and said you will be that storm cloud and suddenly there he was he was a storm cloud <clears throat> and he floated over the land and it rained harder and harder and harder and the rivers flooded and the creeks flooded and the people sought shelter in their houses on the high ground because so much water was coming down and he rained harder and harder and everything floated away and <clears throat> everything went it fled before his might until suddenly he came upon a large large large rock and he rained down upon it harder and harder and harder and harder but the rock did not move and he threw all his might his worry might <clears throat> onto that rock but there it stayed and it did not move and finally he looked at it and says ah oh, there is one that is mightier than i i wish to be that rock and the angel came from the heavens and said it will be as you wish and suddenly there he was he was that rock and there he stood in his stony might, immobile. And everything passed by him had to go out of its way. It had to pass on his right, pass on its left. And there he stood in his stony might. And everything passed. Until one day, suddenly, at the foot of that stony might, he felt something. And there, there was a stone cutter that came up to the stone. And he took a chisel. And he drove it into a wedge, a crack in the stone. And he started taking his maul and <clears throat> beating it and beating it and beating it. And suddenly a piece of rock came off and cracked off. And he looked worried and says, ah, look at this, this one, he is mightier than I. And he said, ah, I wish to be that stone cutter. And the angel came from the heavens and it will be as you wish. And there suddenly he was. He was a stone cutter and he worked hard long long hours for little pay but from that day on he was contented Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. in the early days of islam uh, <clears throat> sayyidina ali had moved to kufa from medina when he was after he became the khalifa and so it was the khalifal city of islam and since it was the capital city, many people came from all over and settled in the city where the Khalifa lived. Now one day, as Sayyidina Ali was walking down the streets, he saw a servant girl sitting just outside the market. And she was crying and crying. And <clears throat> he looked at her and said it was his duty to look after all his people. And he cared for his people. He went up to her and says, ah, tell me, tell me girl, what's, what, what happened? What's the problem? And she looked at him and she did not know him but he had a kind face as he looked at her and she said ah <clears throat> it so happened that <clears throat> i'm a servant girl to this merchant and he he sent me to the market to buy dates and i bought him a bag of bought a bag of dates and then i brought it home but he did not like the dates so he sent me back to the market to the merchant who sold the dates and i asked him to, to get the money back and bring the dates back. We haven't taken one of the dates from it. And I came to the market stall and, and he, he chased me away. He would not let, let me return the dates, take the money back. He chased me away. <clears throat> and now I'm here, because if I go home to my, my master, the merchant, he will beat me because I don't have the money. And if I go back to the market, he will also chase me away <clears throat> and chastise me. What am I to do? And Sayyidina Ali, he looked and said, come, come, come with me. And they walked into the market. And there they went to the dates, <coughs> the date merchant stall. And the dates merchant, who had only recently moved to Kufa in the market, in the sukh, he stood there and he did not know who Sayyidina Ali was. And there he saw the servant girl coming with a man beside them, who was supposed to help him. And he started berating them and berating them because of what they wanted to do. Until finally somebody came around and said, told him who this was. This was not just anybody. This was the Khalifa. This was Sayyidina Ali. 
And as soon as he did, he ran from behind his stall and he threw himself on the floor and said, pardon me, pardon me, pardon me. I did not know you. I did not know who you were. And Ali looked at him with great displeasure and said, ah, but when it was an honest servant girl who wanted to return the wares, you didn't care. But now when it's power and authority over you, you throw yourself on the ground and rub yourself in the dust. And at that moment, the merchant who had heard about the, the servant girl and Sayyidina Ali taking her to the market, he came running up and says, ah, please, please, please, look at all the trouble she's caused you. Look at all the trouble she's caused you. No, no, no, no, please, pardon me, pardon me. And Ali, Sayyidina Ali looked at him and says, and he realized he did not care about anybody. He didn't care about the servant girl, no. He only cared about himself and how he would look in the eyes of the Khalifa. And he turned to both of them and said, you see, you come here, you say you're Muslims, but Islam has not entered your heart, her heart yet. <clears throat> it's mercy, it's goodness, it's honesty, is far, far from you. Which action of yours do you think would please Allah? And with that, he walked away, and of course the servant girl was given the money back to give to her master. But, inshallah, they learned a lesson. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Once there was a sultan, and the sultan found that his royal treasury was being depleted. There was less and less and less coming in. And he found no solution. <clears throat> he had no idea where the money was going, found no way, no solution to replenish his treasury. And he was in a quandary. And finally he decided, <clears throat> he called one of his messengers and sent them out to one of the wise ones, one of the wise people in that country, a sheikh <clears throat> whom he knew had a lot of wisdom. And the messenger came to the wise one and says, <clears throat> Ya Baba, please tell me, the king sent me. His royal treasury is being depleted and he wants to know from you what advice you can give him. And the wise one looked at him and was silent. He didn't say a word. And finally he stood up <clears throat> and he walked out the door, not saying another word. Well, finally the messenger said, please, please, can you then give me a letter, give me something on paper, an advice for the sultan? And still he didn't say a word. He told him, <clears throat> he he gestured to him and he walked into the garden. And there he picked up his shovel and he went to a bed of turnips and he started digging up the big turnips, taking them out and replanting them with little seedling turnips. And then he went to the bed of beets and he dug up the big beets and replanted them with little seedlings. And so he went around the garden to various vegetable beds and he dug up the large vegetables and replanted them with seedlings. And then he told the messenger with a gesture to go on his way. Well, the messenger perplexed, went on his way and came back to the Sultan. The Sultan said, please tell me, <clears throat> what advice did he give you? And he says, the wise one, he didn't tell me anything. He didn't even give me <clears throat> a letter to give to you or anything on paper, any advice. Well, tell me then, what did he do? Now he told me he went down to his garden and he started digging up the large vegetables and replanting them with seed things all over the garden in different beds. Ah, said the king. And he sat there for a while and thought deeply and suddenly he, li he <clears throat> lifted his head and he went and he dismissed his governors and his tax collectors from all the different provinces in his country. And he replaced them with new, fresh ones. Ones <clears throat> that were not known and that were <clears throat> not corrupt and that would bring the taxes back in. And surely, soon after that, the royal, the royal treasury was <clears throat> filled again with the money that belonged to it. One day, Joha, he traveled out into the desert, but in typical Joha, the typical Joha fashion, he didn't take enough food and he didn't take enough water. 
and he traveled on and on. <clears throat> and finally, he became thirsty, became hungry. He was looking around, seeing if there was anything to eat, anything to drink. And finally, ah, there in the distance, there was a small oasis. So <clears throat> he beelined it for that oasis. And finally, as he came to that oasis, he saw this beautiful green oasis. He was overheated. He was hot. He was sweaty. He walked there. And not only that, there was a Bedou sitting there in that oasis. And in front of him, he had a big cloth spread out. And on that cloth, there was a big pile of dates. There was a big pile of figs. <clears throat> there was hops there. There was bread there. There was cheese there. There was a big leg of lamb. And he was standing there, hungrier, because he'd been traveling all day in the desert. And finally, he looked at that and he stood there with saliva <clears throat> almost coming out of his mouth and his stomach rumbling and rumbling. And that Bedou, he kept on sitting there eating and eating and eating. And finally, the Bedou looked up and said, Ah, who are you and where did you come from? Me? I'm from your very own people, from your very own place. Ah, good, said the Bedou. Then tell me, tell me, tell me, please, please, please. How, tell me, how is my son Suleiman? Ah, your son Suleiman? He's wonderful. He's a flower amongst the children. Everybody loves him. Well, how is my wife? Please tell me then, how is my wife? Ah, your wife, she's like the full moon. She illuminates everybody <clears throat> and anybody who has a need comes to her and she gives it to them. Ah, oh, wonderful. Tell me then, how's my, my, my dog, my melon, my dog, Melaton Morat? Ah, your dog, he's fierce. He's become even fiercer. Nobody can come to the house who's not allowed because he won't let them unless <clears throat> your wife allows them. Well, then tell me, how's my camel, my camel speedy? Ah, your camel speedy. He's eaten so much, he's, he was eaten so much, he's grown another hump. Well, by then, with all this good news that he conveyed to the Bedou, he definitely expected to be sat down <clears throat> and share his food as was necessary and uh, obligatory according to the laws of hospitality. And his stomach kept rumbling and rumbling louder and louder, but no, there was no invitation forthcoming. And without an invitation, he couldn't sit down. And he stood there waiting and waiting, but no, no invitation was forthcoming, even though his stomach was louder and louder. Until suddenly, there was a mangy dog that came into the oasis too. And it stood there, <clears throat> looking very disheveled, and its tongue hanging out, panting and panting and panting. And finally, the better looked up and says, Ah, what kind of dog is that? Ha, no dog. I am not like my militant Morat. Oh, no, said Joha. <clears throat> Your militant Morat, he was a very, very fine dog. What do you mean, was? What do you mean, was? Did he die? Did something happen to Morat? Ah, yes. Alas, Morat, he choked <clears throat> while chewing on a bone of your camel Speedy. What do you mean, my camel Speedy? He popped off too? Ah, oh, your camel Speedy, alas, he broke his front legs and his necks when he stumbled over the grave of your wife. What do you mean, my wife? My wife died? Ah, oh, your wife, yes. She was grieving over your son Suleiman. The house, it fell down and collapsed on your son Suleiman. They brought him out from under the ruins and buried him. At that point, the Bedou had jumped up and he was tearing out his hair and said, terrible news bearer of news bearers, oh misery and woe. And he ran out in the direction where he had come into the desert, screaming and yelling. And Johan, he sat down behind that cloth and he turned to that mangy dog and he cut off a big piece, <clears throat> that leg of lamb and handed it over to the dog and turned to it and said, you know, Sometimes, when there's meanness, meanness is the only means. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <clears throat> Once upon a time there was and there was not, in Central Asia, a sultana. And this sultana, her husband the sultan had died. 
and she had one son, a young son for whom she was the regent. But she had one fault. She loved to spoil her son since he was her only son. So he grew up <clears throat> not knowing any good manners. He grew up being spoiled and taking everything for granted. And as he grew up, suddenly the Sultana realized his manners were not the manners of the Sultan should have. He was taking everything for granted. He was not caring about the people around him. He was only caring about himself and what came to him as the Sultan, as the future Sultan. And she was more and more worried until one day she said to her wazir, our son, he has to be taught a lesson. Please, <clears throat> can you find somebody to be his teacher, to teach him adab, to teach him good manners, so he will be a sultan that the people will look up to. And the wazir went around town and he found an old sheikh, a sheikh that he knew about, who was a wise one. And he called him and says, please, please, can you come and teach the son of the sultan, our future sultan, can you teach him? And he came to the palace and he sat with him but the boy's behavior was so rude <clears throat> that after for a short while he realized that his lessons were not fruitful. Finally, he turned around and said to the Sultana, please, please, let me take him on a journey. Well, okay, she gave permission to take him on a journey. So he set off with the young boy and they walked and they walked for several days until finally they came to a beautiful field an orchard and they camped out in a beautiful field along a small stream and there as they sat there suddenly two birds flew up and they flew in a tree next to them and they started twittering twittering and twittering and the wise one he looked up at the, <clears throat> at the young man and said you know i was taught taught the language of the animals and i can tell you what they're saying but of course the young man he was very curious and said, please, please, can you tell me what they're saying? Oh, yes, he said, but I don't know if you want to hear it. It's not, it's not very good. He said, please, I want to hear, tell me, tell me. Well, the first bird, he said, ah, soon in this country, it'll be great for us. Because <clears throat> this young man that's sitting there, he will be a careless and cruel king. And the people will want to leave the orchard of this country and all the fruit will be hanging off the trees and there will be nobody to chase us away, to put scarecrows up or anything like that. And we will be free to eat our fill from this fruit day and night. And the other one, he was saying, well, and when the flocks, when the flocks of locusts come, there will be nobody in the fields to burn. <clears throat> and to create smoke to drive the locusts away and we will be able to feed full on locusts day and night. Well, the young man, he sat there silently thinking, but what was he to say? Well, they traveled on and they went another day <clears throat> and soon they came to the desert and as they crossing the desert, they came to an oasis in the desert. And as they sat there in the oasis, suddenly two camels came. <clears throat> and they started drinking from the water in the oasis. And they started grunting and moaning <clears throat> and groaning as camels do. The young man looked at him and says, please tell me, tell me, what are they saying? Ah, let me listen. And he listened. And he said, ah, I don't think you want to hear what they're saying. <clears throat> what are they saying? Of course he wanted to hear. They're saying, ah, oh, this oasis, it'll be useless soon. Because so many people will be wanting to leave this country that is unfruitful. <clears throat> when, the, <clears throat> when this young man becomes the future sultan, that all the greenery in this oasis will be trampled. The water will be muddy and there'll be barely enough, enough for us to drink when people are leaving this country. And they groan some more. The young man became more and more silent. And the next day they traveled on and they traveled again for several days and they came to a high mountain. And as they were climbing the mountain, suddenly there was an eagle that came <clears throat> and it landed just above them on a crack of rock where his young were. And it screamed and screamed and screamed. And the young man, he looked and said, please, can you tell me what he's saying? Yes, I will. But you won't like it, he said. Well, what is he saying? 
Ah, oh, he said, soon, my young, the eagle said to his young, there won't be any fat lambs to catch in the meadows of this country. There'll be only scrawny ones. There'll be snakes and lizards <clears throat> in the ruins of the capital city because of the Sultan who doesn't care about his people and will be having to live on a diet of snakes and lizards instead of fat lambs. And this will happen soon, unless... Unless what? said the young man. Unless the prince changes his ways and day by day he improves his manners until he will be a sultan that the people will love and will be of benefit to his people. And then this country will flourish. Well, that night was a very, very quiet night. And the young man didn't say anything after that very much. And the next day, the wise man, he turned, the sheikh turned to, this <clears throat> to the young man and said, well, I think it's time we return home to the palace. And they did. They slowly journeyed back to the palace. But every day, his manners increased a little bit better. And every day, he seemed to care more about the old man, about the people they met, and about everything that went on around him, until finally they came to the capital city. And his manners had greatly improved day by day. And finally, the sheikh he went to the sultan and said, I think it's good. I think from now on you can find other teachers to teach your son. Because he has learned that in order to be the sultan of a country, he has to be first the sultan of himself. And sure enough, soon after that he became the sultan of that country. And it flourished and the people loved him. And he was of great benefit to the people. There was an old man with seven sons and he knew that the end of his life was near. So there was one thing he wanted to do. He called all his seven sons to him. And he told them the strangest request. Even though they knew <clears throat> he was soon to pass from this world, he told them out and each of them to get a branch. And they all walked out and they all found a branch, all his seven sons, and they came back with him. And each one had a branch. And then he told his oldest son to take his branch and break it. <clears throat> and he broke it easily. And he told his other son to break it. And he broke it easily. And each of them, he told to take their branch. And each of them, he told them to break it. And one after the other, all seven of them, they took their branches and broke it. Then, again, he told them to go out and find another branch. And each one of them went out. And all seven of them, they found another branch and they brought them back. And then the old man told his son, <clears throat> one of his sons, he says, tie these branches together as strong as you can. And the young man, he tied all the branches together as soon as he, as strong as he can. And he told his younger son, now take these and try and break them. And he took the bundle of branches and he tried to break them, but he couldn't. And then he told his second son to join him. And they tried to break it, but they couldn't. And each son, he told them, <clears throat> the third and the fourth and the fifth, each one, he told, to get, get that bundle and together to try and break it. Until all seven stood there trying to break that bundle and they couldn't. And then he told them to untie it. And each one took a branch and he told each one to break the branch. And each one broke their own branch again. And he said, you see, this is how it is. Each of you, if you're on your own, you do your own <clears throat> thing, and you do what is of no benefit to others, you're easily to break. But if you stay together, if you stick together, and you be at one, then nothing or nobody can break you. Remember this after I leave this world. This might be of benefit to you. And of course they did. And they stuck, stuck strongly together and they became successful and wonderful people.
It is easy to enjoy the elegance of Islamic calligraphy, whether or not you can actually read it. It is the most important and ubiquitous of Muslim arts, both because of its key function in communication and because it's visually fascinating, as we see in this tile from a mosque in Iran. Historically, Muslims have regarded the highest form of art to be calligraphy, literally beautiful writing. It is important both because of the sanctity of the Word of God and because of restrictions on figural imagery in religious art. It is often said that Muslim art bans human images, but this is not quite true. Figural imagery was and is avoided in religious art, that is in mosques and in the Kaaba in Mecca, seen here. Now that's to avoid idol worship. But elsewhere, in palaces, bathhouses, storybooks, there was a lovely tradition of painting and sculpture with images of people. You can see examples in the art spot on the arts of the book and painting. Calligraphy's importance was not primarily due to the absence of figural imagery, however. Since the beginning of Islam in the 7th century, calligraphy was essential because the scribe was charged with a highly meaningful act, writing the word of God. God's word, which is recorded in the Quran, had to be written correctly, skillfully, and beautifully, and because of this, Qurans were not only sacred texts, but also works of art. The Quran itself gives prominence to the role of the pen, with a verse that commands the faithful, recite in the name of thy Lord, who taught by the pen. The first Quran manuscripts were written in an early form of writing called Kufic. Kufic is a style that consists of a few simple pen strokes. The form of writing was so simple that it didn't include vowels. The reader simply had to know the text before reading it. It was a form of literacy predicated on being able to read a limited repertoire of texts that were already familiar and thus recognized rather than deciphered. Encountered in this way, early Kufic was more like a reminder, a visual cue to supply from memory the letters that would complete the text that was already known. Of course, the most important text was the Quran. And while few people would have owned a copy of the sacred book, they would have memorized key parts or even all of it. That's a prodigious feat of memory. Just to give you an idea of that, to even recite the Quran from beginning to end in Arabic takes 30 hours. The Quran might be read aloud in the mosque during prayer or during lectures, and key verses might be inscribed on the walls of the mosque. At the mosque of Cordoba in southern Spain, the mihrab, that's the niche that indicates the direction of prayer, was enframed by a beautiful mosaic inscription. I talk more about this magnificent building in the art spot on mosques. There is a great variety among early Qurans. But most early Qurans were written in large, blocky Kufic letters with only a few lines per page and only a few words on each line. By the 8th century, the pages conformed to a horizontal orientation and had little ornament, other than the gold illuminated headings that called attention to the new chapters. This was more than ornamentation for its own sake. It served to guide the reader visually through the text. Thus, the bright gold chapter headings and rosettes were useful visual cues. Writing has such importance in Muslim art that it is used in places where in other art traditions they might use pictures. For example, in coins. The earliest Muslim coins followed the model of earlier societies and displayed the image of a king. This coin is dated 660. But in a Muslim coin minted 30 years later, the image was replaced by a simple blessing with the date of issue. And that model, the one with no figural imagery, became the norm thereafter. In addition to the Quran, writing could also communicate information about human society. The public inscription that runs across the facade of the Madrasa Mausoleum of Sultan Kalaun in Cairo is an example. It glorifies the Sultan who built the complex. Written in large scale and very visible, it says that the building was built by the August Sultan al-Malik al-Mansur, sword of the world and true religion, lord of kings and of sultans, the sultan of the length and breadth of the earth, and so on. The inscription is long and egotistical. It can be read in full at the Art Spot's web pages of the Muslim Journeys website. As we see in the textile Art Spot, writing could also be placed on the hems of rich fabrics. Kufic writing was difficult to read because its angular letters tended to look alike, and so gradually more rounded cursive scripts were adopted. 
By the 10th century, more than 20 cursive scripts had been developed. Concurrent with the shift from Kufic to cursive, the page itself shifted from horizontal to vertical orientation, and more ornament was used. In this 14th century Quran page, the chapter heading is elaborately framed in blue and gold, and each verse is marked with a gold rosette. We've seen that in Qurans and mosques, important religious precepts were conveyed through script. It is interesting to contrast Muslim and Christian art in this respect. In the portal of a medieval church, such as the 13th century Cathedral of Leon in northern Spain, statues of saints reminded the faithful of the church's promise of salvation. This system of communication relied on the congregation's visual literacy, the ability to recognize Jesus and the saints and the theological concepts that they represent. In contrast, in this 14th century mihrab from a mosque in Isfahan, there are no such figural representations. Instead, words run around the recessed mihrab and the framing arch. These instruct the worshiper in faith and practice by quoting directly from the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad himself. Of course, this anticipated a viewer who could recognize the Arabic words, in cursive on the outer rectangular frame and in kufic on the inner arch. The panel in the very center reads, in beige and white letters, the Prophet said, the mosque is the abode of every believer. As a consequence of the emphasis on literacy, calligraphy appears on all forms of Islamic art and becomes one of the primary forms of embellishment, for example, this simple 9th century bowl has no ornamentation except its Kufic inscription, which states that it was made by a man named Umar. A 12th century mosque in Cairo, in addition to its geometrical ornamentation, has inscriptions in a script form called floriated Kufic because of the way the letters erupt upwards in leafy foliage. The 17th century Sheikh Lutfullah Mosque in Isfahan has a lovely exterior dome of colorful tile. There is a profusion of different script styles, from geometrical lettering fitted into the shape of a star, to elegant cursive script wrapping in a band around the base of the dome, the letters interwoven like the threads of a tapestry. A skilled calligrapher knew all these many script styles and might show off his skill in a sample page. In some ways, calligraphy was a deeply conservative tradition, demanding exactitude and emulation of the master. This is understandable. When writing the Word of God, it must be perfect, and there is little room for experimentation. But in writing that was not specifically religious, a good scribe could exercise innovation and make script more visually exciting. This 17th century Ottoman edict, with the Sultan's signature written for him by his court calligrapher, shows the extent to which letters and visual ornament could intertwine. Calligraphers working in many other art forms also played with script, adapting it to form complex geometrical figures and ornamental designs. The art form continues today with masters trained in the rigors of correct calligraphy, as well as inventively infusing it with new artistic vigor. In other words, calligraphy has a rich historical tradition, but it can also be thoroughly contemporary, as we see in this work made in 1996. Throughout history and into the present, script conveys content and meaning through the words themselves. But calligraphy can also be appreciated abstractly for its visual complexity, refinement, and beauty. Islamic Art Spots are a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys is a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities in cooperation with the American Library Association. Support for this program was provided by a grant from Carnegie Corporation of New York with additional support for art and media components from the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. To further explore the Islamic art spots and the Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys, visit the Muslim Journeys website.
Capril, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the Asia Society Texas Center. We're so pleased to be here to celebrate the Islamic Arts Festival, and we're so glad that the Islamic Arts Society has decided to move this to a virtual format to allow people to be able to participate this year. We're longtime partners with the Islamic Arts Society, working together to host several events, like our annual Asia Fest, our Festival of Eid, and we always come to the Islamic Arts Festival so we can work with the children through different activities and just immerse ourselves in the art. So today, we have two different activities for you. Um, one is a geometric art lesson uh, that we think you'll really enjoy, and the other is a lantern making. So thank you again to the Islamic Art Society for inviting us to be a co-sponsor. We are proud and happy to be here, and we look forward to the festival. Thank you.
we'd like to go on a journey to Morocco to see the beautiful Moroccan lanterns. Morocco is located in um, Africa and you can see that on my map here you're looking at this little orange area here in the northeastern part of Africa. That's Morocco for you. And it's been a very interesting place, a place that has drawn interest for several years um, because of its proximity to Europe. And um, it therefore was able to develop a very interesting culture of its own, which was influenced by um, the Arabs, the Berbers who lived there, and of course, the Europeans, particularly the French. This, uh, and Spain and Portugal, of course, played a part too. So they evolved into their own style of designing and creating things. Um, and their lanterns became very famous the world over. Also, we must uh, re reflect a little bit about the concept of light um, and the concept of noor, which is light in the Islamic world. And um, a, a, a reference to noor is very, very, um, uh, is very important in the Islamic culture. So uh, we're now going to make our own beautiful Moroccan lamp. And it's a very, very simple process. I'm going to remove the map and just take a piece of paper like this, fold it down the middle. Oops, there we go. Right. Fold it again once more. So you've got four sections. Here we go. One, two, three, four sections. All right. Fold it back again and give an additional fold. All right. So it kind of looks like a little one inch band, almost, right? Just make sure it's all even. Now, very carefully, not on this side, but on the side which has all the folds, and that is important. The side which has the folds is the side that you're going to use to draw your little shapes. We, um, I'd like to reiterate that um, Islamic design and Islamic art involves something geometric, something floral or vegetal, and of course, calligraphic. Here I'm going to create some geometric, large geometric half shapes. Okay, so once you've got the shape ready, you cut it out. Right, there we go, right? You've got your pretty patterns. If you want to cut more, you can cut more. So you fold it back and cut more patterns if you wish to, or leave the space open so you can draw your design. So just go to your first section. Again, symmetry is the word. Go to your first section and you draw out a pretty design of your choice. I'm just make, diverting from the design I made in my sample to make it a little more modern, yet with that little element of Islamic designs. And you can add your little tulips were very popular, making their way from ancient Bactria, which is now Afghanistan, um, research shows that really it was in Afghanistan area that you first discovered tulips 
and then eventually they made their way to Turkey and from there to the rest of the European world. So just make sure that you replicate the same pattern on all four sides. Okay, one, two, three, four. All your four sides get replicated or designed and then you color it in so that it looks like this. Isn't that pretty? So I've got some pretty yellow tissue paper handy. Put it down, right? Put your glue on this side very carefully, right? As such, right? Keep going all around. Paste it nice and straight. Try to keep it to the edge if you can so that you have less cutting to do. From this side out. Okay, so you get the idea. This is now crimmed out. All right. You've got your four sides, fold it, and you can either tape it down like this, or you can glue it down. All right, since we've got the glue, I'm going to go ahead and use my glue stick, but you're welcome to use a little tape. Roll it up like that. So it really looks like a little roll. You don't want to take it too far in. Make sure you're doing more the edges. There we go. Right. All right. And then I make it stand up and pinch the sides. Pinch the sides. Nicely. all four sides and once you trim it out neatly guess what it's going to look like you can see i've got two different styles of uh, moroccan lamps the one on the left has some additional pieces that i attached from the top and my uh, yellow one has, is the one that I just demonstrated using tissue paper. And next to it is a little example of a Moroccan lamp. Well, hope you enjoy doing this, uh, watching this video and hope you enjoy sharing this project. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Hello everyone, Salam, peace to you all. I'm going to demonstrate to you a little workshop on how to make your own magic carpet inspired by Islamic art. And so we will begin and what we will create today from scratch to the end of a beautiful motif like this in the form of a magic carpet, in the form of a carpet. So let's begin and get to this, we are going to need a watercolor paper, a watercolor paper in 11 by 16 inch, or you can use also 11 by 14, as well as you will need tracing paper. You will also need some carbon paper if you have, and a ruler, and some water, and some tea dye, and some paint brushes and pencils obviously so let's begin 
So we're going to begin first with the first step is to dye your paper with tea. So you will need some tea dyed and steeped in hot water. In this case, it is all already prepared. And I'm going to take a little sponge brush like this and dip my brush in the tea and just gently dab it on my watercolor paper. We are going to create our Islamic motif for the carpet from scratch. And what you're going to need for that is a tracing paper, like this one, eight and a half by 11 inches. And what you want to do with this is fold it exactly in half. You don't have to measure this, just fold it exactly in half like we do with origami. And then vertically, horizontally first, then vertically fold it again. And so you've got a crisscross shape and you've got a little center here to work with. Second, I have actually a pre-made pattern here, but I'm going to show you how to create this pattern from scratch, just as a base. And what you're going to do here is create the pattern on one side of the square. You've got four squares and you're going to create a pattern that is going to repeat itself three times, four times in a mirror fashion to create a whole pattern. So I'm just going to grab my pencil and I'm going to start off always with the center of my pattern. And in this case, I'm going to keep it simple. So I'm creating a triangle, a mix of straight and curved shapes are going to display themselves in this pattern just to create a nice balance. And so then I'm going to sort of create a little bit of a border of about three millimeters inside. So I've got You want to probably use best is a, a see-through ruler so you can see through your lines. Once you've traced all of it, you will get something like this when you spend a little time you will get something like this. So you've got the whole motif traced. What I'm gonna do next actually is to demonstrate two different techniques of how to transfer your paper. And what you're going to do here is grab a tape, some sort of gentle removable tape that won't damage your paper when you're taking it off and sort of center it as best as you can. You can also use a ruler to do this or otherwise just eye it. And it's about, it's about two inches on each side and one inch from that side. And what you're gonna do is sort of like place the tracing paper with your pencil facing down. So my pencil side is actually facing down on the paper. And there are two different ways you can transfer this pattern at this point. And what it is, what's an easier way is to transfer it by a burnisher. In this case, this is something I use. It's in a gate stone in the shape of a, of a burnisher. Or you can also use the back of a spoon if you have as well as you can also use any sort of smooth stone you may have like this one. This is in a gate, a jade, something that is very smooth that won't damage your paper. And basically what you're going to do is 
apply enough pressure to the paper where it is going to transfer to your watercolor paper and you just want to make sure that you're covering all the lines but if you want to transfer your pattern by a, a carbon paper that is also something you can do as well so in this case I'm just going to show you you want your carbon side facing down just like we had on the pencil and you just want to draw out your pattern like this So I'm going to just put this aside for a few minutes until I create my border. And what I'm going to do here is make a sort of tassel for the size of my carpet. And all I need is basically a strip of about two inch of a tracing paper cut art on the edges of the borders. border those pointing outwards lines have been darkened with either a 6b or 8b pencil so it transfers easily and if your pencil is not transferring you can always use carbon paper And what I basically use are acrylic inks. This is the Daler Rowney brand. It's my favorite paint that I like to use. And I'm basically going to use the colors that I feel are most striking in a, in a carpet.
the last step that you want to do is grab um, an outliner such as this in either 0 0.3, 0 0.2 or 1. Micron brand is usually good, any sort of acid free. In this case, I'm actually going to use another sort of ink, black ink pen like this. with something in this case a piece that I've spent more time on that is finished that I've outlined completely this is what you're going to create in the by the end of it from start to finish once you've outlined and painted all your gold you're going to create, you're going to have something like this and that you can frame and you can put up in your house. And I hope so. I hope you enjoyed this workshop um, and it wasn't too complicated. Um, but if you apply a little bit, little concentration, a little bit meditation and patience, you will get something beautiful that you can continue and, and repeat with different patterns. You can also use many different motifs when it comes to the flower choices. You can also make the shapes of the diamond very different if you like. So it's all up to your imagination what you like to do with it. You can apply any sort of colors you like. You can change the tessels here and create your own patterns that looks nice to you. But in this case, this is what I've created and hopefully you can mirror it and create something of your own. So that's it. Thank you. Karagöz bir gölge oyunudur. Deve ya da manda derisinden yapılan, adına tasvir denilen insan, hayvan ya da eşya resimlerinin arkadan e, verilen ışıkla perdede yansımasına biz karagöz diyoruz. Deve ya da manda derisinden yapılıyor. Bunlar alıp işlendikten sonra e, çizimleri yapılıyor ve bu çizimler eskizlerin üzerine e, kopyası çıkartılıyor. Deri kesildikten sonra e, kök boyalarıyla ya da pigme, pigment boyayla bu boyanıyor. Ondan sonra e, kontrolleri çekildikten sonra e, çubuk yerleri açılıyor ve onlarla birlikte perdeye yansıtılıp oynatılıyor. 2009 yılında UNESCO tarafından Karagöz Somut Olmayan Kültürel Miras kabul edildi. Ve Türklerin bir mirası oldu. Bu şekilde tasdiklenmiş oldu ve dünyaya duyuruldu. Sonra 2011 yılında da ee, Ünima İstanbul Şubesi bir Karagöz atölyesi açtı. Yine UNESCO'nun yaşayan kültür hazinesi kabul ettiği Metin Özden, Orhan Kurt, Tacettin Diker gibi ustalar Hayali Alpa Yekler'in organize ettiği bir kursa eğitimler verdiler. Ben de o kurslara katıldım. Orada Karagöz yapmayı, oynatmayı öğrendim. Oyunlarda bütün tasvirleri kendim yapıyorum. Aynı zamanda yazar olduğum için de bütün metinleri de kendim yazıyorum. Karagöz'le ilgili ilk belge Topkapı Sarayı'nda yer alan dönemin hayalilerinin yer aldığı bir belgedir. Ancak yaygın olarak bilinen Karagöz'ün ve Hacivat'ın Bursa'da doğduğu, Orhan Gazi döneminde yaptırılan bir inşaatta çalışan bir duvarcıyla bir demircinin dönemin işçilerini yaptıkları mizahla, eğlenceyle alıkoydukları için padişah tarafından öldürülmeleri emredilir. 
ve şeyh güçleri bundan pişmanlık duyan padişahı eğlendirmek için e, bunları Kacivat ve Karagöz'ün tasvirini yapar ve gölgeyle e, oyununu oynatır ve e, o günden bugüne bu geleneğin devam ettiği söylenir. Ya ama efendim işte onun için ben ismini değiştirmeye karar verdim. Ya ne olacak senin ismini? Efendim benim adım bundan sonra hacivat olmayacak. Benim adım bundan sonra mersin olacak. Aa güzel bir isim ya bana da böyle kokulu kokulu bir isim bulsana. Ben ilk perdemi yaşadığım muhit olan Balat'ta açtım. Cumbalı evlerin olduğu bir sokakta oynadım. Bu eski bir gelenek. Bu geleneği Türkiye'nin ya da dünyanın farklı yerlerinde devam ettirmeyi düşünüyorum. Oğlum senin adın bundan sonra bu işe şey koysun. Ya o, o kadar dünyada isim var bana buldu ismi var. Bu adam yemin ederim utanmaz.
Hi, my name is Paul Barshlan, and I've got a special presentation for kids to learn how to do Islamic art. This has been put together by the Islamic Art Society of Houston, and we hope that you'll enjoy learning how to create these wonderful patterns. You might wonder, what is Islamic pattern? Maybe you've seen some beautiful designs in mosques, or maybe your parents have a lovely Quran that has a really nice cover, or some of the carpet pages, or some of the uh, individual surahs will have decorations in the beginning. As you start looking around, you'll see that there's certain characteristics of Islamic art, and as a amazing and complicated as it is, the basics are actually really simple to learn. So I'm going to teach you how to do that right now. Let's start by looking at some examples of my work. This is a ceramic platter about 16 inches across. It weighed 25 pounds of clay when I threw it on the wheel. It's all one single line that weaves in and out to create the entire pattern. This is part of the miracle of Islamic geometry that you can create all of these amazing patterns and use sometimes just a single line to go in and out. This pattern introduces some curved lines. Uh, it uses two different lines to create the pattern. And I've done the outlining in actual gold, which gives it a beautiful sort of glowing effect. This pattern uses a set of very complicated tiles from Iran called Gira tiling uh, that use five-fold symmetry to create amazing shapes. Beautiful art form, very highly developed. 
This is one of my tile patterns. The inside green star is in 12, and then the edge stars in turquoise are in 9. When we put multiple tiles together, the pattern starts to come out, and we see that we can fill an infinite amount of space with the same pattern repeating over and over. You'll see lots of mosques and palaces decorated like this throughout the Islamic world. This pattern is in both 12 and 14. Sometimes I like to play with unusual combinations of numbers because it creates different and exciting patterns. So to do this first part of the workshop, you're going to need to download and print out this PDF file that we have on the website. This divides the circle into 12 for you already. Later in the lesson, I'll show you how to divide the circle into 12 yourself, but if you're younger, uh, I recommend starting out with this one because it's a lot easier to work with. This file is also on the website, and it shows you how to divide the circle. I recommend trying this one if you're in at least 7th grade. If you're younger than that, it might be a little too difficult for you, so you might want to just stick with the earlier PDF that we did, and then you can try this later with your parents if you want. So part of the magic of Islamic geometry is once you have a circle that's divided into 12, there's all sorts of beautiful patterns that you can create inside of that. All we have to do is draw lines between any two numbers, but it's very important that we do it in order, okay? So when you do this, um, what I want you to do is always hold your ruler with your left hand, or if you're left-handed, you can reverse these directions, but spread out your fingers like this. So don't be like this. Spread it out wide like this. Hold your ruler in your left hand and draw on the right-hand side of the line, okay? And that'll keep your ruler from moving around and give you nice straight lines, which is really important. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to connect every fourth point along the circle. So when I say every fourth point, this is what I mean. I'll put my finger on one and I'll call that zero. I'll go one, two, three, four. So that's from one to five. You can also think one plus four equals five, okay? Now it is important that when you do this, you do it in order. So we started with one, so next we'll start with two, and then we'll start with three, start with four, etc. If we go from five now to somewhere else, it's easy to get confused, so I recommend always do it in order. One, two, three, four. So we did one to five, so our next two numbers are going to be two plus four, which equals six, so two to six, like this. And if you think about it, what are our next two numbers? Well, we started with 1, and next we did 2, so next we're going to have to start with 3, and we'll just add uh, 4 to it, and that is 7. So 3 to 4 is 7, and I'll go ahead and line up there, draw a nice straight line in there, and next is going to be 4 to 8, and you'll notice that my arm is kind of having to twist a little. I can get 4 to 8 in just barely, but after that it starts to get a little too hard for me to do what I was talking about, right? So very simple solution right in front of you. Just turn your piece of paper. You don't have to twist your arm all to a crazy angle. Just turn the piece of paper. Okay, so we had 4 to 8, and we started from 4, so next we'll start from 5. And you don't even need to count. Just the last one we ended at, you go one more, okay? So I'll go from here. And doing it without counting, I started here, so next I'll just start at the next point along the circle, which is here, and I ended here, so I'll just end at the next point along the circle here. So I'm going to do this all the way around in order, and you'll see that it creates a really interesting pattern. So 7 to 11, 8 to 12, And here's where we run into problems, right? If we were trying to do 9 plus 4, it would be 13. There isn't a 13, but there is 1, which is, again, just 1 past 12. So the math doesn't matter so much. What matters is doing it in order, right? So we did 9, and next is 10, and we ended on 1, and next is 2. So 10 to 2 are the next two numbers, and we don't have to worry so much about the math, which is good, because I don't actually like math. Um, I'm not very good at it. Even though I do geometry, it's a special kind of visual geometry, which is a lot easier to do, and that's part of why I love it. And now we'll do 12 to 4 here. And that completes it. So that's our first Islamic star pattern that we create inside of the circle. And that's created by drawing, uh, connecting every fourth point along the circle. Now what's really amazingly cool about this is that there are all sorts of different patterns that can be created just by using this simple technique. So, let me turn this around. 
take a look here. This is the same pattern that we just did, okay? So this is made by uh, connecting every fourth point along the circle. Well, it turns out if, that if I'd chosen a different number, for example, every fifth point along the circle, I'd get a totally different pattern, okay? So just by changing the number, you get a different pattern, which is part of what makes this really fun to do. And then the really cool thing is that you can actually do combinations of these. So for example, I can go like this, which creates a really complicated pattern on the inside, or I could even turn uh, like this so that now I've actually got 24 points and I'm creating a pattern uh, on top of that. So just by dividing up the circle within given lines, you can create all sorts of magical things. We can also do cool things like here. This is a combination of lines. I did every second and third, and then from the inside circle, I did every second and third on the inside of that as well. This one's really interesting. I uh, started out in 12, but somehow I've ended up with five-sided stars. How does that happen? It's kind of magic. You'll also note that 5 times 12 is 60, which is the number of minutes in the hour, and that 12 is our division for the clock. Uh, so it's very interesting that these numbers play out. It's because when people first started measuring space and time with a compass, the very first thing they came up with was the division from 6 and from there into 12. So that's why so many things in our culture are based on 12. And and I'll do another cool version here. Combining these two, right, I can rotate and create all sorts of interesting patterns inside of these. Or take this blue one, put it on top here. So this is just like the tip of the iceberg. Um, once you've got the division into 12, there's an infinity of patterns that you can do. And if all of that wasn't enough cool stuff to be able to do with one pattern, there's even more. Check this out. Okay, so we made our division, right? Um, but we'll notice that on the inside here, we see all these points on the inside as well, right? We've made a new shape on the inside. If we drew a circle around it, it would actually be another circle that's already divided into 12. Um, but we don't need to draw the circle because all we need are the points. So every time these lines cross on the inside, I want you to make a little dot right there, okay? So see how there's a triangle here, the smallest triangle on the inside? Just at the base, so ignore that point, but just at the base of the triangle, go ahead and make a little dot. And let's do this all the way around. You should end up with 12 new dots. Okay, and now if you like math and um, you want to number them, you can. You can go one, two, three. You can make little tiny numbers all the way around. However, like I said, I don't really like math, so I don't do it that way. I'm going to do it a much easier way. Um, so all you have to do is just line your ruler up. Okay, we did every fourth, so this time I'm going to do every fifth. So I'll start here, call it zero, and go one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so I'm going to draw a line from here. And next, all I have to do is just rotate it visually. So I can actually just turn the piece of paper. The next point is right there, and here's the next point along the line. So we'll go here, and again, I can just keep rotating. Notice that I'm always holding the ruler on the left, right, and drawing on the right, or reverse it if you're left-handed. So we'll do this all the way around, and I create the pattern for every fifth inside of the one for every fourth. And, you know, this is going along really well, and you're thinking, oh, this isn't so hard, and I've got it figured out, and you're doing really well. And then your brother or your sister says something, and you turn, and you look up at them. And then you come back to your page, and you're like, oh, no, where am I? I have no idea where I'm supposed to go next. Don't panic. Very easy to find your way back. All you have to do is put your finger on a point. Remember, we'll call that zero. Go one, two, three, four, five. So I'll line up from here. And I'm back on track now. So I just did that point. Again, I just rotate. These are the next two points. So I'll do that all the way around. And you'll know you're done when you line up to points that you have already completed. Now, one thing that can go wrong when you're doing this is if you're connecting every fifth point, but then you make a mistake and you start connecting every fourth or every sixth point along there, then you'll end up with more lines than you're supposed to have, um, and that's a little confusing. So if that happens, um, I recommend just starting over, um, unless you've only messed up one or two lines and you can figure out which ones they are. <clears throat> okay, so here's the pattern for every fifth inside the pattern for every fourth. So it makes a really cool design there. Let's take a look at some possible ways that we can color some of these patterns. So here's one. 
this is a nice example. Um, so I started out at just as we did, right? I connected every fourth point to get one to five. And then on the inside of that, I made another drawing here. This time I did every fourth point on the inside of that pattern to create a new design in there. Let's see what happened here. Um, so here, I connected every third point, which is one to four. So if you look, you can actually see that there's a bunch of squares here, actually. So this pattern is made out of three squares. And again, three times four is 12. So we're back to our magic number there again, because we've divided into 12. From there, let's look at this internal circle and see what we did. From here, that's zero. So one, two, three, four. So that's every fourth point on the inside, okay? So I did every third point on the outside and then every fourth point on the inside. Here's an example of doing something more complicated. Um, this is in interlace, which is something that we see all throughout Islamic pattern, these beautiful lines that weave in and out. Unfortunately, that's a little more complicated than I have enough time to show you today. Um, but if you want to start working with some of these patterns, you'll learn uh, different ways to do it. And there's lots of tutorials and lessons online, many of them available for free, um, that you can learn how to do some of this stuff. Here's another example of a pattern. Um, so playing with all sorts of different options here and creating different shapes and how you color them can help you bring out different shapes. So that's part of the fun and part of the magic of doing this. So now that you can divide into 12, um, there's all these different patterns that you can create from there. So if you're a younger kid and this is a little bit difficult for you, I recommend just printing out uh, the PDF that we have on the website and you can have as many circles already divided into 12 as you want and do as many different color patterns as you want. You can color them with markers, you can color them with colored pencil, whatever you want to do. If you're a little bit older, there's another technique you can use to learn how to divide the pattern for yourself, divide the circle into 12. And I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that. Everybody's welcome to try it. My experience has been that kids um, around fifth grade or so, um, it's pretty difficult for them to work with the compass. Maybe some kids can do it if they have a parent or an older sibling to help them, or maybe some kids are really good with their hands and they'll be able to do it. But what I don't want you to do is to get frustrated. So go ahead and try it. But if you need help, just ask your parents. And if it's too hard and you just want to color, just print out the PDF that I have on the website and you don't have to worry about it. But if you're in sixth or seventh grade or older, why don't you go ahead and try to divide the circle into 12 with me. So I'm going to show you how to do it. So if you want to try dividing the circle into 12 yourself, you're going to need a compass. There's lots of different kinds, but I recommend what's called a spring bow compass, which is a kind that has a little dial here. Uh, these are about $15, not super expensive. If you have a really cheap plastic one, sometimes those don't hold the shape very well, but uh, you can try it with that and see where you get. Um, and if it doesn't work too well, you might want to consider getting a better compass. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust my compass now. And uh, it's great if you can get 11 by 17 paper. Um, if you can't, you can do it on 8.5 by 11, it's okay. If you have 11 by 17, I want you to adjust the radius, which is the distance between these two points, between the metal point and the pencil, to 3 inches on your compass, okay? And make yourself a nice big circle in the middle of the piece of paper. If you're on 8.5 by 11, instead you can do it at 2.5 inches, will work very well. From here, pick the compass up. Put the metal point anywhere on the edge, not here that's outside, not here that's inside, it has to be on the line itself. It can be anywhere on the line, here or here or here, doesn't matter, but it needs to be on the line. Then make a little mark right here, and then keep this metal point in and flip the compass over and just make a little mark here. So we have two lines that cross the circle. Now pick your compass up. Take the metal point, go exactly where the line crosses. Not here at the end of this line, that's not right, and not here, that's outside the circle, exactly where it crosses. And again, make a little mark here. Keep this point here, flip the compass around, mark here. Watch what happens as I do the next one. When I mark backwards, I form a little X on the edge of the circle. So that lets me know exactly the point that I want. When I go forward, I make a new mark. I'm gonna come back to here. I mark back and I get my X, I mark forward, and look what happens when we get to the last one. As we mark back, we get an X, but as we mark forward, 
we line up exactly where we started. So the circle divides itself into six. This is part of the magic of geometry. The radius of the circle, the distance between the point and the edge, divides the circle into six itself. So that gets us into six. To get to 12, we're going to need to go halfway between these two points. So I make a mark in space above here, and then I pick the compass up, come over to this side, mark over here, and I make an X that sits above the circle. Let me show you what happens when a lot of kids try to do it. They'll say they want to go between these two points. They'll go here, they'll make a mark here, go here, make a mark here. They'll be like, what is that guy talking about? Those lines don't cross. Okay, the problem is where you drew them. We know we want to find the middle point, so that's somewhere along here. So you have to pretend you see a line that goes roughly around here. So that's kind of where my mark needs to be. And I made a mark over here. It has nowhere near my finger. But you'll notice if I continue the line to about where my finger is, and do the same on the other side, these lines actually do cross. They were just in the wrong place. So doing these two, right, I'm going to go here. It's going to be somewhere around here, so that's where I'll make my mark. Come back to here, and there we go. And if your marks ever don't quite cross, like here I'll miss intentionally, oh, they don't cross. No problem. Just go back to the point make it longer, now they do cross, okay? So we'll do that all the way around. And if you come up to this and your line goes off the edge of the paper, you can actually just make your compass a little bit smaller. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the compass smaller here. Just need to be more than halfway. So this is roughly halfway. So I'm going to make my finger just a, a, a little bit in there, and I'll make the compass just a little bit bigger than halfway. And now I'm going to mark here, and again come to this point, and mark back. What that does is it moves the X closer to the edge of the circle. So you'll see I can actually do that same thing up here. It doesn't matter where they are. So that X is closer to the circle than this one, but they both share in common that they're identifying the point we want. So if I put my ruler on there and line up through there, I can see that they both fall on the same point. So I'm going to go through the center and through the X and make a little mark. We'll do the same on the bottom here. I'm going to do that in all the orientations. So here's the X, here's the X. I line up through, okay? And make sure you're going through where the lines cross, right? You don't want to be here like that's the end of that line and here the end of that line. That's not right. You need to be going through the points of the X's, right? That's the axis, okay? And we're going to do the same over here. And now all we have to do is number our points. So this is 1, the x is 2, this is 3, the next x is 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. And now you have a circle divided into 12, and you can play with it and create all sorts of magic and wonderful patterns. You can find lots more of examples of uh, different patterns on my website at barcelonceramics.com. Feel free to visit to see some of the things that I've been up to. If you want a good basic introduction to how to do some of these patterns, I recommend this simple book by Eric Brug, Islamic Geometric Patterns. And if you're really excited about Islamic Pattern, there's a wonderful series of online classes available from artofislamicpattern.com. They're not necessarily designed for children, but uh, some of you who are a little older will find that you are able to do them. Thanks for joining the Islamic Art Society as we did this fun virtual workshop. I hope you had a great time, and I hope it sparks an interest in Islamic geometric design, because once you start drawing and creating these patterns, there's no limit to the wonderful things you can create.
Islamic Art Society aims to share the rich heritage of Islamic arts. We organize events to celebrate our culture and promote the positive image of the Muslim community. Art is a universal language and gets people talking. By sharing Islamic arts, we hope to promote mutual understanding and bring the broader American community together. We organize the Islamic Arts Festival, which is the largest and oldest festival of Islamic arts in North America. The festival brings people from diverse cultures and faiths together for a day of learning, fun, and festivity. We hold art displays and live demonstrations in schools, colleges, and public libraries. We have collaborated with numerous organizations, both within and outside Texas, to deliver quality art programs. I'm Jana Hoagland, director of Lone Star College Tumble Community Library. I have known Islamic Art Society and its wonderful artists since 2016, and what a great experience it has been ever since. We were lucky enough to host a special event an art exhibit by Islamic Art Society as recent as July of 2019. During that time, our library became a true art gallery with amazing artwork. We also were lucky enough to host special classes and workshops of calligraphy and henna. Ever since I was introduced to henna, I'm in love with it. They shared with us their passion for art, for their culture, and we were very appreciative in being able to share their story with us in our community. Assalamualaikum. My name is Zulfikar Ali, and I'm the founding board member of Islamic Art Society. I'm also the director of Calligraphy for the Society. Islam has a lot of rich culture, and we want to bring that culture to the community here. We also believe that art transcends all the boundaries, and that way it can bring uh, community together and also mutual understanding between different communities. Today, I have uh, one of the master calligrapher, Monthar Yusuf, with us. Uh, he will show us how to do um, Nas calligraphy. As you know, there are many fonts, uh, Nas, Kufik, um, Diwani, Sulas, and Nas, you know, many other fonts. But today, we'll focus on Nas. So, I, it's my honor to introduce to uh, Monthar Yusuf. How are you doing this morning? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for having me here. Uh, um, I'm glad to be able to participate and deliver a good message to the people here during this pandemic. Um, yeah, so hopefully, inshallah, we'll be doing some uh, calligraphy, um, show you how to do a Nasr calligraphy. But um, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, so my name is Mandir Yusuf. Um, I came to the States in uh, about 2001. Uh, the, I'll, Tell you a little bit about my journey with calligraphy. So, uh, I learned calligraphy when I was about five years old, and I came to learn that because um, I was born in Algeria, and because of the French influence, uh, they wanted to bring the Arabic language back to the uh, to the people. So, one of our classes actually on first grade was to use a feather and ink uh, and write Arabic uh, wow. uh, Fonts, yeah. So that got me really uh, attached to calligraphy and my dad noticed that and he started bringing me uh, books and uh, tools and you know I picked that up. So at the beginning it was a hobby but then um, when I moved to Jordan uh, my cousin actually happened to be a calligrapher and he was teaching calligraphy at University of Houston so I got influenced and inspired by him so I did work with him. I 
took all the classes in the university to learn all the fonts. Um, and uh, I got really, really interested into it. And, and we did also some side work. It was always my second work. I used to do signs, printing. Um, so I kept in touch with the calligraphy at that point. Um, so it's not your profession, but it's your hobby. Yeah, so you, yes. by profession, what do you do? So no, I'm actually, I work with the oil and gas company software. That's, that's my, my background is IT and chemistry. Uh, but calligraphy, you know, it's one of the arts that we, people can pick, you know, if you have a hobby, uh, one of the hobbies could be music, could be art. So it just happened that I really liked, I got into the, uh, the calligraphy and I, and I spend the time on it and I, it's really beautiful. So I encourage people to, you know, take a look and start learning. Don't be discouraged oh. because you, you will learn it. It takes some time, but uh, you will learn it. Yes. All right. So what they can, they can expect at the end of this uh, calligraphy session? Because I know it takes a long time if you really want to perfect it. And a lot right. of people don't have that much time. Sure. So, but I noticed that you learned it. No, you are it's teaching it, and time, you uh, in their uh, in their life. Uh, that it's you know the the sooner you you start is probably the better. But don't force it on the kids, for example. But it's good to introduce it to them. I have students who are really uh, young, uh, but if they like it, they will latch into it, and it will, you know it, it will grow with them. Um, but the good thing, so there is different when you learn it on your own. It takes you longer to, to learn the techniques. So if you have a chance to actually participate in a class, that will speed it up. That's my recommendation. So here I, I can hopefully in this hour, um, I know it's short time, but I can probably point you to the to the techniques and to the to the basic rules of calligraphy. And if you start with those, you build on this foundation, and hopefully you can you can add up to it and, and get to the level that you want. It. All right. Don't forget to check out our uh, Facebook, Islamic Art Society Facebook. We will always have a lot of information coming there about the classes, about the festival, about the library events. So please keep in touch. Yes. Thank you. Um, another thing I want to add, if, uh, if we, what we're going to show today is actually um, we're going to write some individual letters. Um, then we're going to move to connecting uh, a few uh, to, uh, to uh, alphabets. Then maybe we actually write a full word. So if I can show you this, guys, for example. This is uh, the alphabets here. Uh, we, we're going to be talking about different alphabets, showing you how it looks at the beginning, at the end, at the, uh, in the middle of the letter. Then at the end, of, we can show you how to write, for example, inshallah. Um, when you look at it at the beginning, you say, oh, it's a little difficult, but uh, I will walk you step by step how to write it and how to balance it. So uh, just join us and uh, bring your pen and just use the best of your time. Thank you. Right. See you. See you Here then. we go for the class now. Thank you. Uh, again, the class in the beginning we will be doing, um, you know, calligraphy. But at the end, question uh, at the end we will entertain all of those ones. But in the meantime, if you have any question, um, feel free to text it. Thank you. All right. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, thanks for the introduction, brother. Uh, I'm glad that we're. Um, able to do something during this pandemic uh, so nothing will stop us inshallah so today we'll try to uh, record this class and hopefully many people will be able to rewind it again and look at it again um, I'll do my best to illustrate um, as much time permits uh, about the Nasr calligraphy of course uh, one hour is probably not enough but I'll try to get you guys as much as possible um, but the most important thing is that you need to take it up on your own and start looking at scripts and uh, watch videos on YouTube and it will teach you a lot. This is how people teach you stuff. Okay, so without further ado, um, so if you, if you are a beginner for calligraphy, I uh, just want to give you a quick introduction to the tools that we use. Uh, so usually uh, the, the basic tools or the original tools that people do, the calligraphers do calligraphy with are the bamboos. Um, and the bamboos, um, it's a little hard to work with, but it gives you really nice curves and ends. Um, uh, and you have to use an ink with that. So this is the ink roll and it has uh, something called Leica. So it doesn't absorb too much ink and it doesn't smudge the paper. Uh, the paper that you need to use, um, it's uh, prefer that you have something glossy paper to write on. So this could be used for printing. This, uh, you could buy this from Home, uh, Home Depot printing paper uh, as long as it's glossy so it doesn't sm the, the ink will not smudge on it. Um, and uh, what other tools? There's also some 
pens for practice. You can buy the, those pens that um, uh, brother uh, will, will show us some, but there are some that you can find in Hobby Lobby or the market, which is, it is uh, three millimeters. Um, uh, and those are actually, cut. they will be chisel tip, just like the bamboo. Uh, for example, this three millimeter here, I don't know if you guys can see it, uh, but it is a chisel tip. So it would give you um, the chance to do some nice corners. Uh, unlike the American or the English calligraphy, um, uh, I will zoom in here again, please, on the on the bamboo. So if, if I just put it here, see, it's it's cut 45 degrees. Uh, the English calligraphy will be straight. So that will give you a little bit more flexibility with the angles because we have too many angles in the uh, Arabic calligraphy. Okay, so those are the tools and let's get started. So the first thing with the, if you're doing any kind of scripts, it's better to, um, to have a line to go on. So your, your writing is going straight um, and people can see it balanced because at the end, uh, you want your work to look balanced and nice uh, when you look at it from far away. So we're gonna start with um, just a simple line in the middle of the page or the top. Then the other thing I wanna talk about is so we need another guidance for uh, the length of the alphabets, and there are rules for for each font. So for the Nasser font, uh, for example, I'll show you guys here some some rules. Um, if we can zoom in a little bit, then um, see for example the alphs. If we can zoom in a little bit, uh, the alif and the ba and each font well, will. Maybe you can write it. Show it on the. Yeah, the, I will show it, but um, I'm just showing it here. That I'll, I will write it, but uh, technically, it's you need some um, some guidance for the length of the letters. So the extension of the uh, the L, for example, will need five dots, and the dots are determined by the thickness of the pen that you're using. So let's try this. So I'm I'm gonna use this bamboo. And this bamboo actually will tell me, so I'm, I'm going to start with the dots, so because this is going to be my guidance. So this is how I'm going to put five dots. One, two, three, four, and five. So this is the highest of the elf. And again, it is decided by the thickness of the bamboo. If you have a wider pen, then this elf will be longer because the dots on top of each other will take more space. So now if I wanna write an elf, for example, um, uh, for those who know calligraphy, you know you need to hold the pen on um, 45 degrees, always. So this is my 45 degrees. Then the elf will look like this. This is the highest that I'm gonna start with. Then it will go a little bit tilted and towards the end, it will be a little bit thin. So if, if I do line like here, and a line from here, so you will see that it actually shifted a little bit to the right. And towards the end, there's a little space here. So those are the measurement for the elf. And this is the single elf at the beginning of any word. Uh, now, if elf is connected with another letter, for example, let's say that it's connected with the ba. So this is my ba. Then when I go up, see it takes, sometimes we make this little bit extension and the nasikh. So here, my ba is two dots, two dots and a half maybe. And the extension here again is still the five dots, the height. Here I have two dots in the middle. Okay, now let me show you the elif with the lamb, for example. So let's say that we have a ba we have lamb elif here. See how we curved a little bit to the left. Then from here, we're gonna go down. 
and we touch the line and this is the lamb alif this is how it looks like the lamb alif you start with this shape then you close it like that so and if you notice here the lamb alif here is a little lower than the alif at the end and here we have about two dots space in between all right so this is the alif and the bat just remember guys and if i want to show you the dot as well this is the ba for the dot and for the two dots for the nasikh specifically for the nasikh you need to separate them a little bit and this comes with practice so that so the next dot is not exactly next to it it needs to be a little bit farther then you just connect them with a little line that's the beauty of nasikh it just makes it look a little bit different okay let's move to another letter let's do the ba so we introduce the beginning of the ba here so you have to do uh, about two dots and now we get into what is how the shape of the letter looks like depending on the following letter so if i have a letter that's going up high after the ba for example i have a dal so this is the ba it's going to be two dots high and this is the dal okay so here this is called the high ba because the next letter was going up it's a high letter so let's see how it looks like the ba looks like if we have a letter that is going down for example ra so then the ba looks like this and this is the ra see how with nasif we need to be able to do a full turn and control on with, with the bamboo to give you that nice fine edge so here the ba and the second one was it was really thin at the beginning and it was only one dot high okay let's do another line uh, high over the line then about four below the line and you guys need to pay attention to the letters uh, that goes above the line or below the line those are the rules that we need to follow so here let's start with the gene we said we need to go about three dots high so you start from here the gene usually started with a dot like this then you need to go through the dot so the extension of the gene here like we said about three dots three to three to four uh, four sorry four to five then we're gonna go back here halfway and this is the close and this is the end so if you look here if we drop a straight line from here and a straight line from here so these will be a line but the end of the ha or the kha will go about a dot or dot and a half out so this is the individual cup let's see how it is how it looks like when it's connected so again it follows the same uh, rule that we talked about about the ba depending on the following letter if, it, if the letter is going up the shape of the gene will be look different than if the letter was going down so for example if we're going to do ha alif we call it the closing kha or gene so this is what closes the gene. Then we're gonna go like this. And you see, you have to be really patient when you're doing the strokes so you're actually getting the full extension of the pen. So this is the gene when it's followed by a letter that's going high. So let's see when it follows a letter that's going down. For example, this, this time let's do the meme. So this is the ha, 
So you notice that it's open. I did not close it because the following letter is actually going down. So here's the meme. And watch the meme. So the beauty about Nasikh is sometimes that you have to write with two thirds of the pen. So that means that the pen is not fully touching the page and you're not getting the full thickness. So watch this. If I do, I'm gonna do it here on the side, the meme, while I'm doing it with the full thickness of the pen, which is not recommended. See? So now I'm doing the meme. I'm not, I'm putting the full pen like, like it, all the thickness. So the meme looks nice here, but in Nasser sometimes they want this part and this part to look a little smaller and smoother. So watch here, I'm using two thirds of the pen. See, see how a meme looks like? Uh, and some parts you will notice that you're actually drawing the letter. That's something about calligraphy because you know, in Islam, we don't, uh, drawing is, uh, is not prohibited. So all the focus was on calligraphy and calligraphy become, become an art. So it's actually drawing, you're drawing the letters, you, you're making the letter look beautiful. And it, it, it, it's, you know, it's rhyming with the other letters. So this is how the meme looks like in the finished product. It looks a little thinner than the one that we looked here that's very angled. Okay, so this is another letter. Um, let's see how much time we have. Let's talk about, um, for example, we can talk about the Ain. Here, so let's put, again, we start with, uh, with lines. Don't forget to put the lines. And towards the end, I'll show you actually it will be smarter if you can put a line at the bottom and a line at the top because once you start adding the accents uh, then your your um your writing will be balanced into between two lines so here let's do the harf ayin um let's let's do the ayin at the beginning of the letter um then we'll do it at the in the middle and at the end so start with this shape and now we're going back to the drawing point that we talked about so now some some parts you have to draw with the tip of the pen to get the angle and the shape that we're looking for So that's the ayin at the beginning. And if you do the measurements again, so it's about three dots high. And it's about two dots length. And notice here, sorry, notice here that, see, this is the line that is actually going up a one dot. So let's look at the ayin in the middle of the letter. For example, we, we, we can write Ba'in. So that's the ba. And because the following letter is going up, so that's why we use this ba instead of the small one. So now the ayin here is closed. So we went this way. Now you go back. Close it. Then you go out. There is an alif also after. Notice how I go with the alif. You can go out this way to the left, or you can go straight and give it that accent to the right. Um, so towards the end, let's do it with meme, for example. So the shape from the top looks like the middle one here. And now the finish at the bottom, it looks like the gene that we just did. So it will go and pass that angle for about a dot and a half. Okay. Okay, let's look at another letter. 
Hopefully, I'm not going too fast, guys. Uh, no, I think you're good. Okay, all right. And for practice, so I'm showing you guys the techniques uh, and the details. Uh, but once once you're practicing, actually pay attention to uh, to where you start writing the iron. For example, when we wrote the iron, we started from the left, then the bottom side, then we did the top side. Left here, then did the bottom, then we finished up the top side. So um, that that's how the beginning of the iron school. And you will see some other letters actually, you'll be surprised. Some letters will be finished. You might finish letters with the word first, then you go back and finish the second letter, for example. And I'll show you how that's when it's connected. Uh, okay, so let's do um, the fa and the qaf. See how it looks like. And the beginning of the fa and qaf and wow actually is the same. It's the same circle that we're, we're doing here. Okay, so we did, we did our line, and it's about three dots high. So you start from here. You could stop here if you want, just to measure your work. So this is how the pin moves moves from this angle and up. Then this is how you go down and you close it. And I'll show you some calligraphers actually. If you look at the at the Nasikh uh, font, um, not the one that's in the books, but uh, if you see like an artwork, what they do to the fa and wow is this. So I do the fa like that, then they go back and they close it halfway. See? So this is the fa at the beginning. Now look. In the middle, see we went this way, then we sharp, we did a sharp turn that way. Then this is the close. Let's say that it's followed by aya or ta. Then let's see how it looks at the end. So this shape will look exactly like the one in the middle. Then, imagine when we did the ba, we did this side, so it's a ba. So this movement is actually the ba letter that we added the fa here, that we added this shape and made it a fa. And if you wanna do a qaf again, the two dots are not too close to each other, then you just link them with a, with a dash. Okay, and on the qaf, let me show you also how the qaf looks at the end of the letter, or if it was individual. Um, for example, qaf, uh, qaf like that. Look at the beauty of calligraphy. So this is the fa, the beginning of the fa. Now I'm gonna do it with a different color to show you. I'm gonna write a noon. And that will actually make the fat for me. So this will teach you two letters in one. So this is a noon. So if you do the noon, then you close it with that cough shape, then you got a cough. And last thing is that looks for here is the wow. It has the same shape. Then you finish like the ra, because this part is actually a ra. Then you close on it like that, and to make it nice, you could do that with a fan. All right, let's look at other letters. So, okay, let's do some. Oh, the sod and the seam. Okay, let's start with the seam. See how it looks like at the beginning, the middle, and at the end. Because you know, seam and sheen are the same letters. So, the beginning of the seam, it looks like the bad letter, but a little smaller though. 
then about one dot then the second part of the seam this part is a little longer see how we did an extension then you finish it up with a noon and see how the, I think you guys can see the line but this is the line this is the individual seam this is the seam in the middle If there is two seams that separated by a ba or ya, for example, see the ba or the ya goes a little higher here. Then we go again to the next seam. And let's finish with a wow, for example. Okay. So if you just want to do the measurements here, so this is about two and a half, and this is one nukta, and those are two nuktas. So guys, the dots are very, very important for measurements, because if you extend a little more than it's supposed to, then it would look off. Let's look at the sod. The sod has some interesting movements here. And by the way, guys, if you if you uh, practice nasikh, it is your key to the the next hard form, which is thuluf. So usually, people that want to write thuluf, they have to. Uh, they have to actually practice and master Nasakh before you move into the Thuluf because Thuluf has a little bit longer extensions, but it's the same base of the Nasakh levels. Um, and there is also um, a combination of Nasakh and Thuluf, it's called Ijaza. And that's actually one of the fonts that the calligraphers get tested on and they, when they practice, um, when, when they compete, they, uh, that's one of the fonts that they actually that they get to compete with because you're using two fonts following all the rules to show your skills and capabilities. So just a reminder again, if you want to do the thuf, it's better to practice and master the nasakh first, then you move to the thuf. Okay, so let's look at another letter. We said we're going to talk about the sad. So we have our line here. So you start with a 45 degrees. Then there's a little curve here, and it's good to show the angle. In the thuluf, for example, this angle will be smoother. It's going to look more like a curve, but on the nasakh, you have to show the angle. So these are the small differences that I'm pointing out uh, once you guys become masters in calligraphy or you get deep into it, you will know and see what I'm talking about. Because at the beginning, we will be looking like you know general look over the calligraphy. But once you get into it and start practicing it, then you would see the small differences and the tiny differences. So this is the sod at the beginning. Let's see the sod in the middle. But actually, let's do a ta so I can show you guys how the ta looks like. this is the end of the ta then you go back here and put that small extension down then the alif will be smaller than the regular alif so it's not five dots because it's coming on the top of the letter so it's about four dots here but if you want to see the measurements for the sod so this extension here is about three dots and this one is about two dots and you're going only half a dot above the line. But this space is also one dot. Okay. The, let's see the finish of the sod at the end. So this is the sod at the end of the letter or if it's individual. Let's 
see we we have about half a dot above the line now the extension here should be about three dots and you come just touch the line here notice guys that the finish of the slot doesn't go to the same level of the beginning here we have about a dot and a half difference here and the extension of the sod internally is about three dots. All these measurements is very, very important. Otherwise, if I ride the side a little bit longer and the iron or the foul small, then the, the word would not look balanced to the eye. So that's one of the things that the, uh, in the calligraphy competition, um, they actually focus on. Yeah, I will also add to this that um, if you have any question, uh, you can post it through this chat on the Zoom, and I will pass that on to Monter Yusuf. Um, but we will also have an open question answer session for the last 10, 15 minutes. So the way it is that uh, Monter will teach you alphabets and the word combination, and also he will dis you know showcase one of the phrase or anything like that to show you how it's written by a master calligrapher. And uh, in the meantime, if you have any question, Please feel free to uh, use those in the chat. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, brother. All right. So I think we have some time to do yeah, we have a little about, bit more fonts. Yeah, we have. I think we can keep on going maybe for okay. the next uh, 15 minutes okay. with the fonts. All right. So the next, uh, we have another 15 minutes to explain more alphabets. Then we can move to some practice. All right. So let's look at, so we did the sod. That will cover the thought about how let's talk about the calf. Okay, calf is interesting here too. Uh, calf is actually one of the letters that distinguish the Nasif because uh, you can do different shapes with it. Um, some of it will be short, some uh, will be long. So let's let's talk and cover about those. So let's talk about the short calf at the beginning. Let's say that if a calf is followed by an alif. Good. That's good. Yeah. All right. Let's see if, if a calf is followed by Alice. Um, so it's it's recommended that you do the short version of the calf. And that will be that extension here. Then you go up. Then you close it up with this movement. So here. Um, let's put the measurements. So from inside, it's about two dots. And here it's about four dots high. So it's uh, or three and a half, actually. It's a little bit hot passing the length of the elephant. Length of the elephant is five, as we said. So three and a half will be used for the extension of the calf for that curve. Now this, you could do, um, it's recommended to go from Six to seven dots length. That's the extension. Okay, now let's look at the long calf, which, like I said, it's one of the um, beautiful letters in Nasif. So, see how you start from here, and you have to kind of measure how many dots you need to leave. So, the extension for this is again about seven. and riding with a bamboo guys you will notice that it's not as smooth as riding with a pen because you have to continuously dip in the ink so see how we did, I just want to show you guys if I do a calf with the elf the long version it doesn't look that nice so that one looks nicer now the long calf looks better with a letter that's going down like the um, that a raw for example see how that movement here it wasn't straight and same here, we, we did a little dip, and this is the one. Then you finish it up with the top part, like that. Um, 
and let me put the extensions here so this is we said about seven two three four five six seven dots i try to show two different colors so it'll be easier for guys to watch and follow but this one got smudged <laughs> okay so that's the calf <coughs> um let's talk about the meme so the meme have very different shapes depends on where it falls in the in the world if it's at the beginning uh, some of it will be open some of it could be closed uh, in the middle we can do open and close as well and at the end we can do open and close meme is really really flexible so i'm, I'm gonna write a series of m letter letter meme so you guys can see so at the beginning i showed you before that you can do it open like this Okay, then you follow by the letter, but you can also close it depends on the next letter. So if you have two memes on top of each other, it looks nicer if you do it this way. See, it's a closed meme, very, very lightly open. And this is the closed meme. Then this is again, this is an open meme in the middle. And this is a closed meme in the middle if you want to do a close. Watch the movement of the pen. So we almost we did this circle back again. And this is at the end with the extension to the bottom see these are all the shapes for the meme that you could possibly do for Nasakh and some of it will be really similar to the one on Thuluf by the way um, so let's do again okay another shape for the meme that looks really nice if the one that is followed by yeah for example so you can do it two ways you can do it this way this is the yeah then we go back here i remember we we did the meme that was kind of a drawing and this is the finish or you could do that long yeah like this Then you do with you end up with the close meme like that. See both. It looks different um, now. Depends on the sentence when you write the sentence because you know when you're doing a work when you're doing a calligraphy work, uh, especially if you're working on an art piece. Um, Technically, you are actually you're practicing several times b before you do the uh, the final work, uh, and that's what the, that's how a calligrapher can distinguish themselves from others. So, so you write it one way. Let's say I end up with uh, yeah and meme. So you try the first look, the short version, then you try the long version, see how it fits with the, um, with all your work, with, with the rest of the words and the rest of the uh, the sentence. Then you can decide which one to use because both of them following the rules, but then which one looks better uh, on the final product. Okay, just a reminder. Okay, so that's the meme. Let's look at another letter here. Um, okay, we can do the yeah. And I think by this, we almost covered all the letters. So let's do the yeah. Yeah needs some work too. Uh, let me get another paper here. Do you need more paper? I can. Yeah, I, th I think I have some. Okay, sure. Pick okay, them. let me just pick. Sorry, guys, let me pick more paper. I did not expect that I'm going to use all those. Okay, so we got more paper here. So we said we're gonna talk, we're gonna do the yeah letter. So we'll, we'll explain how the yeah also looks. There's a short version and there's a long version, just like we said that the cap. Um, 
Yeah, also another letter that distinguishes the uh, nascent forms. Okay, so we'll do a line again. And ya yeah, is one of the letters that goes below the line, by the way. Okay. So uh, the first part of the ya uh, goes above the line. So like this. Then the second part is exactly finishes on the line. Then the third part would actually go below the line and go there up until you reach this part. And the measurements for this are three dots here and about three dots here the highest and here you can go up to four you could do also small you could come here and do a little bit smaller for three that's also acceptable now the extension here <coughs> so you can extend this here here and it would connect with the following word and looks nice We run out of ink here. So. That's the one that we could extend. And also there's a yeah that actually go reverse, which meaning you can actually go this way. So that's another yeah. Right? Those are the different shapes of the yeah. And now let me show you also, guys, um, just because we were talking about the extension of the letter, um, sometimes you can do really nice shapes with the extensions and it helps you. For example, I'm just going to write the, the ayakon fayakun and show you. So you can write it with the, I'm going to write it in a, in a small letter here. So you can, you can write it like this, separate it. That's the calf, and that's the noon. So that's con is separated from fa yakun. So I'm just showing you two ways to write the Nasr calligraphy. So you see the word con is by itself and fayakun is by itself. But let's show you, let's see how we can connect it, make it look a little nicer, use the extension. And if you guys remember, we said sometimes one of the letters, even though it's in the first word, we end up writing it at the end. So here, for example, I'm gonna do the word con. Start with the calf. See now look at the noon. I start with the beginning here, but I will show you to finish up the noon, it will be the last thing I do actually. Why? Because I want to know how long it's the the word, the next word fayakun is gonna take. And this noon will actually go underneath fayakun and gives it a different shape. So this is the wall. And this is the moon. And actually, it is recommended that you put the dots last thing because. For example, if I put the dots here then and I wanted to extend the noon, it might come in the way. 
So I will wait on the dots to put it last thing so I can balance my work as well. See, you notice I didn't put any dots except for the new. See, now look at this new. Now I can use the opportunity to extend the new all the way and make it feel like it's holding the next word. See, now I can come back and put the dots because I know exactly what I can put in now. Nice, so this is the fun part. So you can combine two words and make them feel like they're connected using the extensions with the Masikh. We saw how you can do it separately this way and you can, you can do it a little bit nicer this way. Very nice. Thank you. So, um, so that's, that would be alphabet. Um, we can start writing a few words. I'm um, gonna give it a minute if you guys have any questions so far. Yeah, I also have the chat open. So in case if you have any question, you can write that question too. Uh, one of the comment that, uh, you know, Muhammad Hamisa? Yes. He and Muntari, we have worked together. Yes. This is the first time in my life I haven't seen you in love or smile in 30 minutes. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> really? I always laugh and joke. <laughs> Thanks for that comment. <laughs> um, Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. can you write, uh, inshallah, that inshallah. word became very popular. I think uh, Joe Biden, you know, in com uh, coming president, he but also mentioned, he you know, in one of, he, he used that That's word. Interesting. Okay. So can you write, and again, um, I can explain that it means uh, if God wills or God willing. With, with God willing. And so, it yeah. expresses a belief that nothing happens unless God wills. Absolutely. And that this will help supersede all human will. So today I'll request uh, Munther to, to write the word inshallah. Inshallah. Inshallah, I write it. <laughs> it means with God's willing. Huh? All right. So now we're going to write a sentence and I'm going to talk about um, the. Uh, extensions that we're going to use and how to make the product the product looks finished and nice um, so now let's write the words first then then uh, then we'll, we'll put the accents using a smaller pen at this point so let's write the word inshallah first and um uh, al-jalala allah is actually very distinguished and you will see the it follows different rules um, in all the fonts. So the alif would be longer than the lam, lam, ha. Um, it is um, on all the fonts. They they distinguish the word the the, the word Allah of the Jalala uh, to be a little smaller. Uh, so it's actually catching the eye. It would be catching to the eye. So let's see how it looks like. Okay, so I'll start with alif, which is about five dots high. So that's in. Then this is the noon. This is in. In Sha'a. So now watch the elif should go again on the same length here. So it is recommended actually that now that I want to do a, a full sentence and I finish the product, it's actually to put another line. So it give me some guidance and keeps my my word in duct between these two lines. So I'll put another line here. Okay. You can just rotate it so we can see the same. Maybe let it push this way. Right, so, and if you guys notice, I always hold the uh, the inkwell. I mean, you can put it aside, but it's a little farther to go here. It gives you more control, so you can dip the ink and go back faster to the word. And not the point is not to go fast, but just to be more uh, productive. So now I'm going to use this extension here. This is the Hamza. Okay. 
Now this is the lo- the word Allah, and you're gonna you're gonna notice how what I was talking about. This is the alif. Now the lam lam will be almost halfway. Go back like this. Put the Hamza here. Now, see, this looks like the word is finished as far as writing, but what makes um, Nasikh and Thuluf beautiful is to actually use the accents. So, to use the accents, I'm going to do um, a smaller pen. Usually, it's either half size or third of the size uh, for the same pen that compared to the pen that I actually used to write And it has special lip to it, I noticed that. So uh-huh. what this is? This is a little bit different from the reed column, right? Yeah, this one, yeah, this one actually, the, the wood that is used uh, on the tip of this part is harder. Okay. And one of the calligraphs will actually use one pen without cutting it, wrote the whole Quran with it. It's very, very strong. Amazing. Uh, and that's why I use it for the extensions, because sometimes you have to press harder on the, uh, on the pen and you don't want to break it. But yeah, these pens uh, can hold a little more, more pressure than the uh, the usual one. See, this one is open from the middle here, but this one is actually a, a piece wood inserted into the bamboo. Mm, okay, and, and they are durable too. And it's durable. Yeah, it's, okay. yeah, it's nice. Very nice. So, actually, let me so I can show you the accents. I'm gonna do with a different color. And remember, we put those two lines here. So now I'm gonna keep the accents in between those lines as well. So this is called Sukun. This is the Fatha. And here. This is a dash as well. This is the Shadda. Those just to balance the uh, wood. So, so this is kind of the final product here. You guys can see it. With the accents, it look more balanced. You're filling the space for uh, if there's an open space, you can use the proper accents into it. Very good, Monter. Thank you. Uh, that uh, concludes our class. Uh, we will open this to remaining time to question and answer. We can stay a little bit longer if there is a question that we need to answer. Um, but um, that pretty much concludes the class. Um, one question that I have from one of the participants is that uh, my dal and ra and dal are problem. Can you show how to do that? Oh, the dal and ra. Maybe yes. you can use a new page. We sure. can keep it as a you know. Yes. Uh, okay. Souvenir. So the dal and ra. In the Nasakh, they're very distinguished, but um, in our handwriting, sometimes I see people exactly, they mix the da and the ra. Mm-hmm. But um, if we follow the rules, they look different actually. So the dal is higher on the line, above the line. The, the neck for the dal is just like the ba, but it's, it's about three dots. And there's another thing that distinguishes the dal. So you have to have a little curve from the top that's the first part and that's the second part here see you notice everything i'm writing on the dal is on a straight line nothing goes below the line that's my first distinguish between the dal and the ra and the nasakh see the ra here starts like the ba but then it goes below the line and it has a very very sharp end and it looks, the raw looks like the wow, which is, we said it's, the first part is actually the fa, and the second part is the raw. See, now this is the distinguish between individual dal, ra. In the word, in the middle of the word, this is how the dal looks like. And you can actually look up the Quran 
and see how the world will look. See, this is the dal in the middle of the world versus the ra looks like this. Again, it goes below the line and it has a sharp end. Hopefully that explains it. Very nice. Any other question? Are we open this to you know all the audience? Yes. And just to remind people, you know, calligraphy is, I mean, if you like calligraphy, you have to be patient for it. Like we saw today, we spent about an hour, but we barely covered just few letters. But if you actually sit down and practice, when I teach the class, um, usually my students will spend about six weeks just to learn the individual uh, letters. They come in two hours a week, every Saturday for, for six weeks. And we just learn how to write the individual letter, not even connecting to anything. So that, that would be the first part. I want to learn how I write the, each letter, the 28 letters, individually, properly, with the size. Um, then the next thing we move, the next uh, level would be actually start putting those letters in connection with a next letter or, or two letters or three. Then phase three would be actually writing a full word. Then phase four, start the sentence. So you can see how long it takes to, to master calligraphy. So just be patient with it. And I'm sure if you like it, you know, that's something that's the best actually time, that's the best time to spend uh, when you learn something, especially, you know, when you, when you write the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it makes you actually more, more into it and, uh, it, you know, it, it, it gives you satisfaction. All right. Thank you all who joined the class today. I hope you keep practicing calligraphy um, and stay home, stay safe. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum.
Okay, guys, I guess this ends my demo. I appreciate you guys watching. I hope you enjoyed uh, me painting. And also, you're all online um, checking out the Islamic Art Festival 2020. Thank you. What do these people have in common? They are among the millions who have been touched by the films of Unity Productions Foundation. UPF films celebrate great stories of Muslims in past and present. Whether it is the dreams of one Muslim family or the aspirations of a billion, they connect with people in all walks of life. UPF reaches America through its outreach program, 20,000 Dialogues, which engages change agents and everyday people through its schools, civic leaders, and interfaith models. Here are a few examples. The Muslims and Talking Through Walls are seen and heard as faithful, loving, caring people who want to live and prosper in America. My students love Muhammad, legacy of a prophet. The Muslim American voices speak honestly to Muhammad's palpable presence in their lives. Movies represent Muslims as the enemy. Dialogues challenge the status quo. This is crucial because the common knowledge is not true. Muslims are not the enemy. Teachers, faith leaders, and activists screen UPF films and engage audiences in honest discussions about Muslims. Over 150,000 people have participated, and this project continues to have a positive impact. Twenty Thousand Dialogues also reaches thought leaders, such as the former U.S. Secretary of State. When fear takes over, communication stops and suspicion builds. And that's why Inside Islam is such an important film. Changing hearts and minds nationwide. UPF's outreach mission is perhaps best expressed by award-winning author Karen Armstrong. The work that UPF is doing is to try to break down stereotypes in an imaginative way, uh, to, to uh, present Muslims to a world uh, as human beings, like everybody, as we all are. It's something that is very close to my own heart. The Islamic Arts Society aims to share the rich heritage of arts in Islam. We organize events to celebrate our culture and promote the positive image of our community. By promoting Islamic arts, we hope to help build bridges and to bring the broader American community together. Our flagship event is the Islamic Arts Festival in fall every year that attracts over 5,000 people. The festival brings together people from diverse faiths, backgrounds and cultures for a day of fun, festivity and learning. The Islamic Art Society organizes exhibitions in museums and libraries. We arrange Islamic art days, lectures and classes. We have participated in the Asia Festival and the International Festival and our live art demonstrations bring color to these events. Our interactive sessions on Hebrew, Henna and calligraphy are very popular and provide excellent source of education and entertainment.
Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen um, welcome to the 7th annual Islamic Art Festival uh, my name is Zulfikar Ali and I will be hosting the calligraphy show today um, it's my honor to introduce Osama Qureshi he is really good in solace um, and today we will write names duas and phrases so without further delay I will ask Osama Qureshi to introduce himself what was his art journey and then inshallah ta'ala write some names and duas and phrases thank you so much and it's a pleasure being here today uh salam alaikum to everyone and like dr ali was saying um uh i've kind of found myself doing calligraphy i think my journey started when i was very young uh, i noticed that i had an aptitude for writing very well and i had really good handwriting and knowing islam's ambivalence towards figurative art i decided to you know, um, expand my capabilities in that realm. And so from good handwriting, it sort of became more into calligraphy, especially around uh, the time that I was in college. It sort of became a, uh, an exercise in stress relief, especially after like a bad test or something like that. I had to just sit back down and try to write something out. However, you know, as I also grew older, I realized the spiritual significance of it. And most of my art, is actually sacred rather than secular, which is a hallmark, I think, of Islamic art as compared to different disciplines. And after all, uh, Islamic art or calligraphy in the Islamic tradition started out by beautifying the Quran. And, uh, and, and it's, no, it's no coincidence that was the case because for Muslims, uh, the word of God, which is the absolute truth, deserves its own beauty. As Plato said himself, uh, beauty is the splendor of truth. And for Muslims, there's nothing more truthful than God's word itself. Uh, so having said that, uh, in but, you know, I guess we can get started uh, and write some names down, inshallah. Right? All right. Inshallah, yeah. let's yeah. start with uh, anything that you like to write. All right. And then I will give the list that I have received so far. Okay, okay. Well, I wanted to start with one that Dr. Ali mentioned before we, we got started today. And I know because my mom is really, really excited about this show and has been watching it uh, nonstop for the past few days. I don't know for the few days, but the past few months, which is Ertugul. Uh, and uh, it's a show from Turkey and it's sort of it's taken over the entire Muslim world. I think it's broken Guinness World Book Records for viewership. Uh, and so I'll probably start with that one. The main protagonist character's name is Ertugul, which I think is Turkish. Uh, and when I looked it up, it meant brave man. I don't think it has a direct translation into Arabic. Nevertheless, we can write it down in the script. And so having said that, I'll get started. So he wrote Allah first and then this uh, time Ra. So uh, Arabic like English is a, a language that has an alphabet. So a lot of people ask me in the past when I've done these these calligraphy workshops or uh, name writing sessions and so like oh is it like you know mandarin in which you have actual pictorial letter forms and that's not the case you have to spell letters out and the the letters change forms as you write and depending on where they are located within a word so a letter might look different in the start of a word in the middle of a word and in the end of a word can all be different uh, letter forms but they're the same letter uh, and so that takes a little bit of practice getting used to, especially someone coming from the English tradition from a Latin scripts where everything always looks the same, no matter where it's positioned uh, in the word form.
while he's writing, I can give you some history about Artogrul. Um, he was a father of Artogrul. His other, you know, full name is called Artogrul Ghazi, and he was a father of Usman. Uh, Usman is the one who was the founder of Ottoman Empire, and uh, Artogrul, you know, he started from a very humble background, and then he became a king of, uh, you know, all that area. He fought many wars. So he became, there is a, as a, um, Osama mentioned, um, Netflix has a whole series uh, on the life of Artogrul and how, you know, uh, he conquered, you know, such a vast area and uh, then his son became the founder of the Ottoman Empire. And I think it's fitting that we start with Ertugul because I, I feel like as it relates to this particular script, which is Thuluth, uh, it really reached its heyday under the Ottoman Empire. And if you go, if you're ever fortunate enough to go to Turkey or uh, uh, places where the Ottoman Empire was, you'll still see these monumental structures. Uh, and the script that you'll see that looks like Arabic, and it could either be Arabic or Turkish or Ottoman Turkish, will no, most of the time be written in Thuluth. So it has a very rich imperial legacy. And I feel like to this day, you'll see Thuluth written on sort of uh, impactful documents, uh, official government decrees in Arabic speaking countries, or in the title of books. So it has that, that, that, that, that heft to it, that this is important uh, kind of script. And especially if took the uh, already went through the video of that class, mm -hmm. and somebody who took the class on uh, uh, Solus, you know, they kind of emphasize on that and the beauty of it and uh, how you you can uh, you know fit into a very nice geometric uh, figure to make it look, look more beautiful. So now I'm going to go back and, and write some diacritical marks or, or, or letter forms or dots, as it's more colloquially referred to. And these basically distinguish similar letter forms from other ones, uh, depending on how many dots are there. So Ertogul has a T in it, or a T-sounding letter form. And so that's usually denoted by two dots on top of the base letter. If it was three dots, that would become a th sound, like th. If it was a y sounding letter form, you'd actually see me put the, the two dots on the bottom. And so uh, a cluster of letters actually have a very similar uh, morphology, but depending on where you put these dots can actually change the letter entirely. So the kind of vowels you know, closest mm -hmm. to the in English is vowels. Yeah, the diacritical marks are actually, yes, like vowels. And they're usually denoted by sort of slanting lines that can either be on top or on bottom uh, of the letters. And so if you have a slanting line on top, that's the A sound. Uh, and then if it's on the bottom, it would be the E, E sound or E. Uh, because Ertugul starts with uh, an E, uh, I would start with that letter form actually being on the bottom. And so we'll denote the alif on the bottom right here. And there we go. Ertugul. So now I'm just going to sort of finish it off a little bit. Uh, Thuluth is also characterized from other scripts in that uh, it has these sort of pointed hook 
at the beginning of some letters. And it adds a sort of movement to the letter that otherwise would not be there. And it looks quite nice, if I say so myself. Um, and now I'm going to go back and add the aforementioned diacritical marks. So here's the first letter, er. So I'm going to put a line underneath. This is a connecting mark. It's called a hamza or a sukun, I'm sorry, uh, in Arabic. And then we have the U letter vowel on top. And I'm going to switch for the other one. And you might see me switching between uh, pens to adjust for width. And that's up to the artist's discretion, uh, which needs to be smaller, which needs to be bigger. Uh, because in the end, you want it to look nice and you want the composition to have a sense of balance. Uh, there. You don't want all of the letter form to be on one end and then something sticking out on the other end. Uh, unless, of course, it's very um, uh, deliberate and that's what's happening. So, for example, like the word Ali, um, uh, which was the fourth caliph uh, in Islamic history, who was characterized by having a two pronged sword. Uh, and it actually features a lot in his iconography. So, oftentimes, you'll see people write his name, Ali. But then they'll extend out the ya all the way out, and then it'll end in two prongs. And so those are some of the ways you can be a lot more creative uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. And it sort of melds your traditional art with the letter morphologies themselves. So you can make shapes with the writing, but you can also in, uh, invert shapes in the writing. Exactly, yeah. Very nice. yeah. And oftentimes you'll see, uh, uh, particularly in... Um, South Asia, uh, you'll see, uh, I think, um, uh, compositions about Ali, whose nickname was like Haider, and he'll be in a lion. So everything written will be in the form of a lion. Uh, and, and that's actually quite interesting to see. And a lot of people who might not be uh, familiar with uh, Islamic calligraphy and might think uh, that we are completely against figurative art is sort of in a convenient loophole uh, that a lot of Islamic artists have uh, employed in the past. And, and I see sometimes sh ships may, may yeah, being exactly. made of the calligraphy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sometime, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the flowers. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. So while he's uh, uh, working on it, I can show some of his columns and pens, and you can see, appreciate it, uh, how dedicated and how passionate he is about uh, his calligraphy so so for example this is made of reed um, very beautiful column this one and these one also columns but you can see intricate design but each of them is a different size so what uh, calligraphy does is that everything is in proportion so when he, for example he is writing aleph it has a certain length uh, as ex was explained in the uh, Solus uh, calligraphy class this morning and uh, then you ca if you want to write smaller one you can use a smaller pen and this one again is a uh, um, you know kind of the word is, is it Java right this one yeah it's actually Java a, a, a Javanese thorn uh, and uh, it's supposed to be able to write a lot so like any other sort of pen that one might have uh, and we can look at it if you want to look a little closer, you can see that it's cut at a certain angle. Uh, traditionally, I think it's around 40 degrees, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, most of the time in the uh, traditional Islamic world and the Arabic calligraphy, you'll see them use reeds uh, like this. This one is used, uh, a, a reed sourced from Iran. Uh, and most of the time, they will they have to go through a process in which they're dried out for a few months and then they're cured in that sense, and then they'll be ready to write. Uh, uh, with these, these are from the island of Java, as Dr. Ali said, and they're made of a type, a type of thorn which is extremely hard. And I think when I bought this pen, uh, or this pen set, the, what really had sold me was that there was a legend that someone had written an entire Quran with one pen. 
Because normally uh, you always have to like sharpen your pen yes. uh, because it wears out over time when you're writing and you're writing. And those, those edges are important to make sure that your, your letters look crisp, uh, so to speak. And if you don't, then it doesn't look as nice. But with this, um, I don't anticipate me ever having to sharpen it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's and nice. how do you cannot have a bigger column in this one? Because usually it's uh, made of thongs, so you cannot have a much bigger tip than you know, few yeah. millimeters. Yeah, that's, that's the uh, limiting factor uh, as well. Uh, uh -huh. um, can you write, uh, what, what else do you want to show? Or maybe I have some word that I can Oh, we can go on with a different word. That's fine. Okay. Uh -huh. So this is orthogonal, as uh, mentioned again. This is famous series. Yeah, this is the uh, famous um, Netflix series. Lot of uh, you know seasons in that, mm -hmm. and a very famous drama. Mm -hmm. So this is the name of orthogonal in that. Mm -hmm. How about let's uh, switch gears uh, and use a particular prayer that I was a big fan of, especially when I was in school. Uh, and anyone who's a, a Muslim kid who's going through school at the time uh, knows this this particular, what we call dua or invocation. Uh, and it is, uh, I think you can guess, Rabbi Zidni Ulma, which means, my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Uh, and uh, throughout college, when you're trying to cram for a test or something like that, it's always on the back of your mind. It's just Rabbi Zidni Alma, Rabbi Zidni Alma, Rabbi Zidni Alma. And then uh, Pixie. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so, <laughs> Let's see. My. You know, and speaking of knowledge, um, unfortunately, I think religion in general has a bad rap, at least in the Western society, as being something that you simply close your eyes, obey, and don't critically think about. And Islam, seeking knowledge is contingent upon every person. In fact, there is a prophetic narration, uh, or hadith, as we say in Arabic, which is you know, uh, seek knowledge even if it's in China. Uh, in China, in the in the the time of the the prophet was was a journey that would probably take years. Yeah. And so, when people say, "Oh, you know," quote unquote, religious people are unthinking, or they're encouraged by their faith not to uh, not to think too deeply on certain matters, I, I don't necessarily think that applies uh, to the to the Islamic tradition, at least. Uh, it's one that encourages deep thought, it encourages uh, critical thinking, uh, and things that we need, uh, regardless of what era you, you're living in. And that is uh, knowledge that is related to religion, and also knowledge that is for the use of people. Oh, totally. Ilm and Nafi and Ilm Sharia, mm -hmm. both are you know, Quiet. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's true. Uh, I think there's also uh, another hadith uh, in regards to that that said that knowledge is the lost property of the believer and he takes it wherever he finds it. And they didn't specify what sort of knowledge that was. That could be the sacred or, or secular.
again, as uh, Osama mentioned, that uh, for him is a relief, stress relief, um, or what we call meditation. Uh, I myself uh, think uh, calligraphy as a meditation. Um, you know, it gives you, uh, it's like you kind of zone out when doing calligraphy. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're in a, another dimension practically. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, especially in a difficult time um, that helps a lot. Um, and there is a dua about it. Um, actually, there, there is a ayah in the Quran, um, Inna mal usri yusra. Uh, so whenever you go through difficulty, you can read this, Inna mal usri yusra. Surely, after every difficulty, there is a relief. So, um, you know, calligraphy kind of ties up into the whole picture, grand picture. So while he's writing, maybe I can explain um, a little bit. For example, this one, I will use a pen, a column, a pen to show you. This is Ra, Rab, B, and this is Za, Dal, or Zid, and then he's writing Ni again. So these are uh, uh, you know composition combining uh, two uh, letters together. Actually, it's when you're uh, doing calligraphy in uh, Arabic calligraphy, and sometimes you're looking for what would be, if you're writing a letter, you have to make in your head maybe three or four letters ahead of it, how this will look, you know, to make it more beautiful. So when did you started this journey? How old you were the first time you did calligraphy? Um, the first time I did calligraphy, I didn't know what to call it. Um, I didn't know what I was doing. I remember my I was fortunate enough to have an imam when I was growing up uh, in Corpus Christi, Texas, um, who was very very skilled in, in this art form, and and I noticed like oh uh, he writes just as well as I see it in the Quran. At the time, I didn't know, but it was the Nusk script. Um, and then I decided to sort of iterate on that and try to copy it and copy it and try to make the letter forms as closely resembling what he did and what was in the Quran as much as possible. It was only until I think the advent of YouTube, which really opened up these possibilities for someone who was like an amateur enthusiast like me. Uh, to really see how people, you know, hold the pen, the materials that are used, and really elevate the level of discourse uh, that is in, you know, calligraphy. And fortunately enough, uh, with, with, with kids that are growing up these days, uh, they have a lot more resources than I did, for example, growing up in the 90s. Uh, it, organizations like these, the Islamic Art Society, gives people... Uh, 
a, a, a fo an organization to go to if they're interested and there's a lot of resources and if if you even want to take classes uh, something that was unheard of as as short as ten years ago no one even thought about it uh, and I think uh, the uh, the founders of this organization deserve a lot of credit uh, in that respect. Yeah, at uh, Islamic Art Society, we are trying our best to provide the platform and uh, artists like you, especially the young artists, um, they are inspiring other young artists because we don't want it to just disappear with <clears throat> me or the other founders. So now Osama is adding uh, vowels or diacritical marks that, uh, you know, <clears throat> change the how you pronounce it. And also he adds some uh, beautification to it by adding, uh, you know, some smaller shapes into it. Yeah, um, as going off of what Dr. Ali was saying, um, uh, the diacritical marks are a component of the the artwork itself when the final composition comes together. And people who even can read Arabic in a uh, devotional sense uh, oftentimes have a difficulty reading calligraphic compositions because it's too busy for them and they can't really decipher what's going on. Uh, but that in itself is uh, is an interesting challenge, especially if you go into more advanced scripts like Diwani, which was, I think, developed around the 17th century or the 18th century in the Ottoman Turkey. Uh, when you, you see it just from a distance, it doesn't look like it's anything legible. Uh, but when you get up close to it, you see the swirling lines and everything has a has actual uh, orthographic value. Mm. Uh, and those for me are, are you know, when I'm as just a consumer of the calligraphy uh, are probably the most interesting compositions because uh, you know they don't seem like anything until you get up close and then you can read it and I think that's one personal thing that I have about when I whenever I'm doing calligraphy or writing something down uh, because there's these there's these new uh, trends uh, that I see in calligraphy called callig or calligraffiti uh, which is sort of graffitiized calligraphy and I've seen that a lot with Latin scripts, mm -hmm. but the problem mm -hmm. I have is that sometimes it's just completely illegible, and uh, and I don't necessarily see the value in that. Do you have anything that uh, to to inspire young artists, young calligrapher? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it takes a long time to learn calligraphy, um, but I see that you have you're studying here, and then you're doing a job, and then at the same time you do calligraphy. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that our audience uh, can do the same thing? Um, well, I think uh, when it comes, it's not like uh, it's not like art is dying out, but we are seeing, for example, a a de-emphasis on the written arts, uh, and that's starting at schools. Uh, in fact, my my nephew, I, I just ordered some papers for him because he wanted to have good handwriting like me. Uh, and I just ordered a bunch of papers and we're going to be starting to write. So if you're interested in this, um, and it is like you said, like you're helping to preserve a tradition and that links you back generations to different Muslims. And it's like a connection to the past. All right. so. Thank you everybody who's watching it. Inshallah, we will see you tomorrow again. Tomorrow we have another artist, calligrapher, uh, Huzafa. Um, Huzafa Taki, he will be here and inshallah he will show his beautiful calligraphy. So see you tomorrow inshallah. Asalaamu Alaikum. Wa Alaikum Asalaamu Alaikum.
Assalamu alaikum ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 7th Islamic Art Festival. My name is Zulfikar Ali and I will be the host of today's show. Yesterday we did uh, names, duas and uh, calligraphy writing. This morning we did uh, Sulas calligraphy class. Now we will be writing names in uh, Sulas, uh, names, duas and phrases in Sulas. Um, it's my honor to introduce Josefa Taki. He has been with us for a long time. And uh, without further delay, I will ask Josefa Taki to introduce uh, his art journey and then uh, do some uh, solo calligraphy. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so my name is uh, Josefa Taki. Um, I am a graduate of Al Jamia to Saifia in uh, Surat, India. Um, that is kind of where my um, calligraphy journey, so to say, started. Um, I did Islamic studies there and um, you know, just through my uh, studies and exposure to the culture, um, I, I, my interests sparked in uh, Arabic calligraphy. And I had you know, other friends and I had the opportunity to uh, you know, learn from other more mature uh, professional calligraphers. Um, and uh, I, I took those moments um, with me and I you know back when I went to my room when I sat down with the pen and paper um, I really reflected on everything that I saw and everything that I learned and I tried to um, you know develop those skills for myself um, fast forward a few years um, I just recently graduated from uh, Columbia University with a master's in Islamic studies and while I was there I had the opportunity to travel to Cairo um, for a study abroad for the summer and there you know i i took that opportunity to uh, contact some uh, professional khattat um, you know people that dedicate their entire lives to this art um, and i took some solos khat, khat solos classes there um, and so you know that was a moment that really um, it was an eye-opening moment and it made me realize how detailed and how cal calculated this art is. Um, and you know, sometimes when you see these calligraphers write, uh, you think that it, it, they make it look easy. Um, but once you, know, once you learn the intricacies of the art, as I'm sure you all have uh, witnessed in the workshops, um, it is very, very difficult and it takes a lot, an, hours of practice and eventually you know, it becomes muscle memory. Uh, you know, that is the goal to make it muscle memory as with any craft. Right. So what is the first thing you plan to write today? Uh, I was hoping to start out with uh, Maryam. Okay. Um, maybe I could write the name Maryam and then we can work on some other phrases sure. and um, things like that. So I think like, we can use this yeah, paper very, for that. Very nice. Um, you know, it's some very beautiful pre-printed uh, uh, paper. Um, I think Maryam in the center will look very nice. Yeah, so as you can see, the frame is uh, basically tazid or illuminations. And in the center, he will write uh, Maryam. Um, many of you are aware of Maryam, but uh, for those who are new to it, uh, Maryam is the same as Mary, the mother of Prophet Jesus. And uh, in Islam, there is a big significance on uh, Hazrat Maryam. Um, there is a, a chapter in Quran named after her. So in a lot of Muslim families have the name Maryam. So now you can see if somebody says Maryam is basically Mary. So inshallah, Josefa uh, will write Maryam for you. Again, this is in Solus calligraphy. And uh, this is one of the most beautiful um, script in the calligraphy. Again, when you're writing on, uh, you know, in a predefined space, uh, you have to be very careful that you want to keep the balance, uh, you know, so knowing how much uh, big the name will be, you kind of choose the pen accordingly, because if it's a bigger pen, if you try to write in a smaller space, it will not look good, because you have to keep the dimensions intact.
So this is uh, starting with this, uh, I can explain Meem, Ra, Ya, Meem, Maryam. And now he's gonna add some diacritical marks on it to make it, uh, you know, beautiful as well as, uh, you know, to, to how to pronounce that. Uh, because these diacritical marks are basically kind of vowels in English. So he's right now he's gonna add those marks and some beautiful for beautifying he's gonna add some other shapes to it. So I just wanted to add a little color. Okay. Um, and so now we have the complete uh, Maryam. Uh, these smaller memes indicate that, you know, th within the main text, you have these memes and it indicates the actual letter. Um, sometimes, you know, when you have very complex and, you know, very intricate uh, designs, it's, it's sometimes it's hard and they're very illegible sometimes. And so they, what they what calligraphers do is that they add these small letters underneath the um, the larger letters so that you know the reader can know that okay this is an ayn or a seen or a ha um, and so I, I kind of use that same uh, method here beautiful to... beautiful thank you thank you Jose for, for you know writing this for us thank you okay well, what else do you want to write um, uh, I was thinking we could uh, write Ahlan wa Sahla. Okay. Thinking that, you know, this is uh, a, a common greeting whenever we have guests at our house. Um, we have our guests with us today in this uh, um, event. And so maybe we can greet them with this uh, phrase, Ahlan wa Sahla. Very good. Uh, again, Ahlan wa Sahla is basically welcome in Arabic. And wherever you see, again, this one is transcends the boundary. Um, wherever in Muslim world you go, and when you say this word ahlan wa sahlan, people understand that uh, this what this means, and that is welcome. So again, uh, Ahlan wa Sahlan can be used for both uh, saying welcome as well as general hello. For example, you want to say somebody, you want to talk to somebody, you can say Ahlan wa Sahlan. So hello or welcome. So it's a, uh, this word can be used in different settings too.
So now we have the, the main text down and uh, I will just embellish it with uh, some of the diacritics and other, um, or the correct term for zakharif, the other little marks that we see on it, uh, the designs. So you are going to use some different color this time? For, for yeah, the, I was thinking about just using some red, you know, black yes. and red. It yes. looks very good together. It's yeah. a good combination. Um, the paper that he's writing on is a glossy paper so that the pen moves on it um, effortlessly. Um, you don't want a rough paper to write this kind of stuff. Um, you can easily find this paper here. Um, one of the ones that most commonly used for calligraphy is uh, called um, finger paint pads. So these are 12 by 18 inches uh, pads and you can write a fairly big word on it or with this size that uh, Josefa is using, you can write a whole phrase or maybe a short aya uh, with this pen. So that is the complete, um, I'll just add, like I mentioned earlier, you know, they add these letters to clarify. So this is the, the complete Ahlan wa Sahla. So that's the crown basically making to make it more beautiful. Yes. Um, some people can make it in one stroke. I have yet to achieve that type of uh, perfection. Um, the, the one easy step is to kind of make make it halfway and then draw in the final tip. Okay. Um, like I did here. Yeah, I have seen a lot of uh, you know accomplished calligraphy doing the same because that way you can be more precise. More precise. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. So let me uh, just 
add some black this time. So he's gonna add some black reticle marks on it. Uh, again, this is uh, basically similar to vowels in uh, uh, English. Um, So Hosefa wrote this man jadda wa jadda. What it means is that he who he whoever strives or works hard shall succeed. And uh, this is quite inspiring. And this uh, kind of relates to his own story that he worked very hard to learn this calligraphy. And as you can see now, he can write beautifully in a very short period of time. I also like his color combination. Just trying to mix it up a little. <laughs> right, very, very nice. Looks beautiful. Thank you. Right. Well, in a short period of time, this is a third piece of art that he, you know, made it and uh, looked, you know, in a very compact place. He was able to write the whole phrase. Um, what else do you want me, uh, you know, want um, want us to show today? I thought maybe we can. Um... You know, uh, like uh, Osama also mentioned um, previously, that many times we write, uh, you know, Arabic calligraphy uh, is used to uh, display sacred texts, and so I was thinking that maybe we can use a uh, an ayat from the Quran. Okay. Um, and the ayat is "Fathkuruni uh, azkurkum," which is a divine promise that you know Allah says that if you remember me, then I will remember you. Um, and so I was thinking that maybe we can write that. Yeah, I think there. that will be a good idea. Um, again, uh, this Fazkuni Azkurukum, this is from the second chapter of uh, Quran, from the Surah Al Baqarah. And the whole ayat is basically says, Fazkuruni Azkurukum, Vashkuruli, Wala Takfurun. Therefore, remember me, I will remember you. And be thankful to me, and do not be ungrateful to me. So today, um, Huzafa is going to write. Uh, Faskuruni uh, Askurukum, which means, therefore, you, if you remember me, I will remember you. So let's watch his, uh, you know, the way his hand movements are, the way he writes. Uh, seventh year we started in 2014 and now it's uh, 2020 and uh, this is the first time we could not do uh, in-person um, 
festival, but I believe every uh, challenge comes with an opportunity and the opportunity uh, for us is that we can be at home and still able to look at all the portion of the Islamic art. We don't have to drive anywhere, but we can see all of the artists, all of the art uh, on display. Um, uh, as you know, you can even buy the art. We go into the you know that list of art that is available for sale, and uh, you can buy the pieces that you like to buy. Um, as far as uh, you know, trying to do calligraphy by yourself, you can do follow these steps and uh, you know start and uh, as if you spend more time you will become better and better at it and inshallah we will have more classes throughout the year uh, if not in person we will try to do over zoom and uh, all you have to do is uh, um, subscribe to our newsletter or go on our uh, website is uh, islamicartssociety.com or uh, if you type the Islamic Art Society in Google, we will always be at the top. So you can go from there and look at uh, what art's going on. Also, we have Facebook. Um, please subscribe to our Facebook, Islamic Art Society uh, Facebook. And we will have information about any upcoming classes or events uh, where you can join us. Just the final touches. So what do you call these these these things these small um, beautifying marks? Uh, I believe the the correct term is zakharif, which uh, translate to um, just like embellishments. Okay. Um, and so there there are a few different kinds. Um, would you like me to illustrate it on the bottom? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I think we can keep. Yeah, keep yeah as I, I've used most of them actually. Yeah. Uh, you know, you have you have this one, two, three, and four. Um, there are a few other. How about variations. this one? Is it also? Yes, this this okay, is one. This is probably one of the most common. You will see this most everywhere. Um, usually, you know, if someone is trying to write in a circle or any predefined shape, um, you use these to kind of fill in the the blank spaces that you cannot fill with the letters, or the actual writing itself. Okay. Um, so this, this is, is beautiful and uh, quite so long uh, phrase. It's now the you know the uh, the whole sentence. Uh, thank you so much for writing this one. I really uh, enjoy this one. It's a very uh, curvy and uh, it's just a lot of fun to write as well. Right. Uh, um, one of our um, you know audience, uh, they are asking to write the name of um, President Joe Biden. <laughs> you know he's over. Uh, I guess it's very fitting. Fitting for the, so, but I know that uh, it's uh, some of the alphabets are not there. Like Biden, the D yeah. may not be in uh, Arabic. So what do you do? What letter do you substitute it with? It. Um, uh, how about I write it in? Oh yeah, I think let, let's, let's, let's illustrate look it directly. And see how it goes. Joe Biden. Okay, let's do it with black. So that's how we write. Uh, uh, he's going to show how to write Joe Biden in uh, solos. Joe. All right. Joe. So as you can see, um, uh, Josefa is writing from right to left. That's how the Arabic is written. So the Joe word in um, Arabic will be on the right side and Biden will be on the left side.
python let's add some so you know you're gonna add some those yeah, back repeating back. marks And I'll touch. All Come right. Biden. Thank you. Can you write uh, in English, Joe Biden? Sure, okay. Uh, don't hold me to my English uh, <laughs> English writing. Oh, just just to, just to make it uh, complete, yeah. you know. Uh, Thank you, Josefa. Uh, we, we saw some beautiful pieces of uh, solid calligraphy and watching them live was a lot of fun. Um, so again, who just joined in, um, this is uh, Joe Biden from right to left rhythm in uh, Solus calligraphy. Um, we, uh, he's our new president. So somebody requested that we uh, write by this name. So here it is. Um, well, thank you very much, everyone who joined the session today. Uh, it, uh, I hope uh, you keep uh, learning calligraphy. And uh, um, today our host was, uh, uh, today our calligrapher is Jose Fataki. Uh, as you can see, he can write a fairly long verses uh, or sentences in a very short period of time. Again, don't forget to like us on the uh, Facebook and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are also on Instagram, so please go there and uh, like us, like our uh, videos. Thank you so much. And uh, by, keep, uh, by being a subscriber to our websites, uh, you will stay in touch with any other programs that we are going to do in, in the coming future. Thank you very much again. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Alaikum okay. Thank you. From simple woven fabrics to luxurious brocades, velvets, fine embroideries, textiles were the basics of life in the early Muslim world. Islam has been called a textile society because you didn't need chairs or beds. Life was lived directly on the floor, which was covered with mats or carpets. In this 13th century manuscript painting, one man sits on a low folding stool while the other sits cross-legged on a raised platform draped in red fabric striped with gold while leaning against a large bolster. They wear richly colored robes trimmed with gold embroidery along the sleeves. It's interesting to see how textiles provide both the clothing and the furnishing. Of all the art forms, textiles cross the social spectrum because they include expensive goods for elite patrons, but also plain cloth for ordinary people. Textiles clothe the human body, but also covered walls and floors. Even in Mecca, toward which daily prayer was oriented, the sacred Kaaba was draped in thick black fabric embroidered with gold. Muslim artisans gained fame throughout the world for the variety of their textiles as well as the beauty of their patterns. Woven, embroidered, and knotted with an endless array of designs, they were made of wool, cotton, linen, and silk, 
and even glittering threads that were wrapped with silver or gold, as we see in this Persian velvet. There was considerable exchange within the Islamic world, but textiles were also important commodities sold to others. For example, in the 17th through 19th centuries, the English sold woolen cloth to Iran and hungrily bought up fine Persian silks, which they greatly admired. Many words in English today derive from textiles made in Muslim workshops. For example, muslin comes from its origins in the Iraqi city of Mosul. And damask comes from Damascus. Cotton is an Arabic word, and seersucker is a Persian word. These words are linguistic signs of the Islamic origins of textiles that had a global reach. However, one prized fiber, silk, came from elsewhere. The silkworms and secretive silk manufacture were smuggled from China into Central Asia and eventually Byzantium sometime around the 6th century. The highly prized fiber was then embraced by Muslim artisans who soon excelled in growing and working in silk. This 10th century textile is a very early example of Islamic silk. Although only two pieces of it survive, we can see that it has figural imagery. Elephants face each other on a dark red ground, while a caravan of camels forms the border. Textiles lend themselves well to geometric patterns because of the way that they are woven with the warp, that's the vertical or longitudinal threads, and weft, that's the horizontal or lateral threads. And yet, as we see here, figural scenes were also represented and also inscriptions. One highly valued kind of textile in the first several centuries of Islam was tiraz, a fabric embroidered or painted with a band containing the name of the caliph, or ruler. The word tiraz literally means inscription, and it refers to a type of Islamic textile made with a calligraphic border. Tiraz may have begun with the practice of stamping the caliph's name on coins, but soon the caliph's name was painted or woven in gold on the hem of robes that he bestowed as gifts of honor. The earliest Tiraz textiles date to the early 8th century. In this slightly later example, the inscription states that it was made in the city of Nishapur in 879. Inscriptions like this are very useful for dating textiles. The early Tiraz textiles came from the caliph's workshops, but by the 12th century, as the royal monopoly was relaxed, Tiraz became a term for any rich fabric with embroidered bands of inscription. In this scene of a caravan of pilgrims on their way back from Mecca, we see that the figures wear turbans, striped leggings, and robes edged with gold lettering. Even the camels and horses are draped with Tiraz fabrics. One of the reasons why textiles are so exciting to us is that today and in the past, clothing is one of the primary ways that we can express our personal identity, that we can externalize it and present it to the people around us. Another important category of textile was the carpet, which could either be flat woven or thick raised pile. Often called knotted carpets, pile carpets don't have true knots. Rather, the threads are wrapped around the warp yarns and then pressed into place between the interlacing weft yarns. A carpet made this way could have as few as 50 knots per square inch or as many as a thousand. Knotted carpets existed before Islam, but throughout the Islamic world, weavers quickly became adept at pile carpet making. For example, Eleanor of Castile, when she went as a bride from Spain to England in 1255, brought in her trousseau pile carpets from the Islamic kingdoms in southern Spain. When we look at Islamic architecture, we must imagine the floors laid with thick carpets such as this, the walls covered with hanging cloths and cushions and mattresses as furnishings. Small rugs could be unrolled and used anywhere to designate a place for prayer. This textile universe is dazzlingly evident in this manuscript illustration where even the architecture is made of fabric in the form of tents. In a desert encampment scene, the bustle of activity is paralleled by the profusion of brightly colored and patterned textiles. Flowing robes worn by people, tents with medallion designs, bold stripes, and floral patterns. Even the camels carry lovely textiles. One wears a black cloth adorned with colored flowers under its blue saddle. Textiles were the most actively traded item in the Islamic Mediterranean. It's important to realize that Islamic textiles were traded not only because their quality was so fine, but also because there was so much textile production. You may notice that I often say Islamic rather than Muslim. With these two terms, I'm distinguishing between 
the word Muslim, which refers to Muslims who practice Islam and things that are specifically religious, and Islamic, which is a broader cultural term, which can include Jews and Christians who lived in Islamic kingdoms, actually with safety and protection and, and harmony. And they might have spoken Arabic, they might have worn tiraz fabrics, they might have sat on piled carpets on the floor. One sign of this interweaving of different cultural and religious groups in Islamic society comes from the Geniza papers found in Cairo. The Geniza was a storage closet of manuscripts, commentaries, letters, and legal papers, basically anything written down, that was found in a walled up section of a synagogue in Cairo. They had been stashed there rather than discarded because they all contained invocations with the word God, a sacred word to be treated with ritual respect. The papers were a wonderful modern discovery because they recorded the ordinary commerce of the Mediterranean and Middle East, extending as far as India from the 10th to 19th century, connecting Jews, Christians, and Muslims in economic relationships across long distances. What we learn from the Geniza documents is that textiles were the most actively traded goods, and that regardless of the cultural destination, Islamic textiles in particular were greatly esteemed. Textiles were simply everywhere in the Islamic world, clothing the body, covering the floor, hanging from walls, and yet the stuff that was actually used the most doesn't survive. Cloth was made of organic materials and was actively worn and used, which means it was soon reduced to rags, eaten by moths, or ripped up for reuse as smaller pieces. Few old textiles survive intact. From 16th century Iran, this handsome silk velvet with glittering metallic threads was once part of a robe or drapery its scenes of falconry, a courtly pastime, plus the sumptuousness of the fabric itself, indicate that it was worn by a prince. But today, all that remains is this three-foot-long fragment. One of the odd ways that some precious Islamic textiles did survive was in tombs, where they were used as burial shrouds. Prized for its vibrant patterns and colors, Islamic cloth was even used to line the interior of Christian reliquaries. Those are boxes containing the bones of saints and martyrs. The fragment with elephants is a case in point. Made in Iran in the 10th century, it was obtained by a Frenchman during the Crusades who brought it home and donated it to his church. In the 12th century, the silk cloth was then used to wrap the bones of the church's patron saint. The Shroud of saint Jos, as it is called, is an outstanding and extremely rare early Islamic silk textile. Textiles are interesting as objects of trade, products of technology, works of art, and cultural artifacts. One of the interesting things about textiles is that many of them were made by women. And so, although we don't have the names of the actual artists, we do have the kind of living remains in the form of the textiles that survive today, works that were made by anonymous women a long time ago. Islamic Art Spots are a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys is a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities in cooperation with the American Library Association. Support for this program was provided by a grant from Carnegie Corporation of New York with additional support for art and media components from the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. To further explore the Islamic art spots and the Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys, visit the Muslim Journeys website.
Can Americans engage with the Muslim world? We are a diverse nation. Listen. Get to know each other, to mutually respect each other. They have contributed to our country in so many ways. They are part of the national fabric of this country. I don't understand Islamophobia. With us, they are building up America. Explore, ask questions, uh, become knowledgeable. We cannot be silent. No point in going into dialogue if you're not prepared to be changed by the encounter. I'm Reverend Dr. Welton Gaddy. Hi, I'm Russell Simmons. Rabbi Mark Schneier. Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Bishop John Bryson Chain. James McJunkin. I'm the Assistant Director in Charge of the FBI's Washington Field Office. I'm Karen Armstrong, and I strongly urge you to visit my fellow American. We can't build America without everybody together. Share your story. In my fellow American. Share your story. Share your story. Ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome to the 7th Annual Islamic Art Festival hosted by the Islamic Art Society here in Houston, Texas. My name is Kaniz Zohra Siddiqui and I am the director of the Henna program with the Islamic Art Society. I'm going to share with you the beautiful art of Henna which is known worldwide as body art. What is Henna? Henna is a plant scientifically known as Lasonius inermis. You will find it in the hotter regions of the planet, such as Africa and South Asia. They grow on trees over on the other parts of the world. Here in the States, we can purchase them in a powder form at international markets. Some literature and artwork indicates that henna played an important role in holistic healing and personal adornment purposes throughout the world, dating back to the ancient times. Henna has a natural staining capability in which it will leave a reddish, orangish, burgundyish stain on your skin that will temporarily last for a number of days, depending on the quality of the henna and the depth of the stain. The powder form of henna may be mixed with multiple ingredients and people have secret recipes that they use to make the henna paste so it can enhance colors with all the qualities. Some people use coffee, some people use um, clove oil, some essential oils. My personal preference is the eucalyptus oil. It has a very aromatic fragrance to it and it's very calming as you're being applied the henna. When the henna paste is applied on the skin, the paste will sit on top of the skin. It will dehydrate and crumble off, leaving a flat stain against the skin. Organic henna will allow the stain to deepen within a couple of days to reach its peak and then it will start fading away and at one point it will completely leave your skin as if it was never there. 
The staining of henna depends on everyone and their skin temperature, how oily their skin may or may not be, how sweaty their skin may or may not be. Um, so you just have to see how henna will work for you. Again, the quality of the henna may also make a difference how deeply it may stain on your skin or not. Better henna with better quality, the fresher the paste is applied should give you a better quality and color of stain. This is a henna color chart. It kind of shows you the ranges that the henna can stain a skin um, from the lightest color of orange to the deepest color of burgundy. And the area that you want is the burgundy dark red area which means that you got a good stain and it should last up to seven days ten days the darker the color stains you the longer it'll last because it'll take a little bit longer for it to completely fade away where does henna grow as I had mentioned, henna grows on the hotter parts of the planet, Africa, Asia, and it takes up to five years for a henna plant to actually grow to its full maturity. How is henna prepared? On the other side of the world where the tree is growing, people can just break the leaves off, they can crush it, um, they can grind it down into a chunky paste, and they usually use like a toothpick or a sharp tool to dip and apply the henna. Here in the U.S., people make henna cones, they sell henna cones, you can purchase henna cones from the international markets. Some of the beauty salons that, apply, that offer the services of henna also sell henna cones. So here in the U.S., we get henna cones already made. They look like this. The wrapper is just a different color, but the paste will relatively be the same. It'll be a dark olive greenish shade of a paste and the stain will be in the burgundy zone. The most popular type of henna is applied to the hand, on either side of the hand, on the fingers, up to the wrist, above the wrist. That is the most popular. In some of the cultures, the bride will get henna applied to both sides of both hands, pretty high um, above the uh, wrist, sometimes even up to the elbow and beyond. Henna on the fingernails. Henna is applied to the fingernails and when you apply it, you have to maybe do a couple of coats to get a deep enough stain where it actually might look like a nail polish. Um, religions where the female ladies, they don't um, put nail polish on for religious uh, reasons, they actually do the henna as well to make it look like their nails have color on them, but not necessarily a nail polish because um, when a Muslim female performs ablution to perform her prayer, the water does not pass through the nail polish. So the ablution process isn't gonna be complete. But when you have henna on your nails, it's basically just staining the nail bed, the keratin, and it allows the water to permeate during the ablution process. So a lot of the Muslim females will have the henna on their fingernails for those reasons, um, as well as they believe that it can um, prevent fungal infections of the nail. Um, so that's also a medicinal benefit. Henna on the hair. Henna is also applied on the hair. Uh, people apply it for their covering their grays or just you know conditioning their dark hair and um, it leaves the same burgundy tint on your hair. So if you have like a lighter color hair, the grays, the blondes, and you put the henna paste in it, it will change the color to the orange burgundy shade. Um, to get a darker stain, you can even apply the henna onto your hair a couple of times. Okay, so you're gonna have your henna cone like this and it usually has a little needle pin inside. So all you need to do is pull out the pin and you always wanna waste the first 10, 20% of it because it's most likely gonna be dehydrated. So I'm just gonna go ahead and waste it. And when you waste it, you'll see that it was black and then it turns light brown. So that's the color that you want. That's the fresh paste right there. The brownish, greenish. When you're ready to hold the henna cone, you hold it much like a pen or pencil. So you're gonna find a place that's comfortable for you to hold onto where you're gonna be applying the pressure for the henna paste to come out. So we're gonna start off by making dots. So we're gonna make dots of different numbers, which is gonna be how long you have to press to get that dot. Let me show you an example. So this is gonna be one. So one second you're gonna press 
to get one second dot. One, one, one, one, one. one. So you're gonna take the henna cone, press against the paper, let the paste out for one full second. One, one, one, one, one, one. So that is going to be your one dot, meaning one second dot. The next one is going to be the three second dot. So you're going to put your henna cone against the paper and press for three full seconds each. So one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So you see the difference between a one and a three. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. The last one is going to be a five second dot. You're going to take your henna cone, press it for five seconds per dot. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So now you have the one, the three, and the five second dots. This is where you want to be, the three second dot. So the three second pressure that you applied is going to be your standard henna design that you apply. The one second dot is what you use to shade your henna. The five second dot is what you use when you want a bold henna design. So now we're going to make a line with this number dot. So if I'm pressing for one second along each point of my line, it's going to look like this. One, one one one one okay when i press for three seconds for each space of the line it's going to look like this one two three one two three one two three one two three when i do the same thing for the five second dot five seconds for each space on the line it will look like this one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So you see how thin the line is at the one second dot, how medium the line is at the three second dot, which is our standard level of dot, and how thick the line becomes at the five second dot. If I doodle in a one second line, it would look something like this. Remember, I'm applying the pressure that I use to make my one second dot. If I use it for my three second dot, so I'm gonna press for three seconds. The same thing I'll do with the five second press. So it goes from thin to medium to thick. So let's do a flower with a one second pressure application. Okay, now we'll do a flower with the three second application. So you're adding more pressure to get it out three seconds for each space of the lines. We'll do the same with a five pressure dot. Much thicker, much bolder. So this is where the standard level of a henna design should be at the three second dot. So I can use my one second pressure like this line and shade it in. One, one, one, one, one. If you have a three second flower and you want to make it into a bolder five second flower, you can just outline the three second line and it'll turn into a five second line. 
If you have a one second flower, you can also outline it to make it the depth of a three second flower.
I am here with my friend Amardeep Kaur and I'm going to do a live henna design.
Felipe Serra, age four, and I just want to say that organic henna is actually safe for all ages, but always do a test piece and make sure that you have no reaction. Islamic gardens are beautiful. They appear as oases in an arid landscape. We approach a high wall, over the top of which we see some trees, the sign of the garden that awaits within. We pass through a gate that is angled to protect visual privacy, and then the garden appears in full, a canopy of leafy leaves, flowering shrubs, colorful blooms, water running in channels toward pools and fountains, maybe a pavilion in the center or off to the side where we can pause to rest in the shade. Running through the garden are walkways that divide it into four quarters. This kind of formal garden, seen here at the Bagh Ifin in Iran, is called a chahrabagh. 
Bagh is the Persian word for garden, and Chahar Bagh literally means four gardens, although as we see here, the garden can actually have more than four parts. The four-part Chahar Bagh organization has often been interpreted as a reflection of paradise, described in the Quran as a shady, verdant garden with fruit trees and four streams running with honey, fresh milk, wine, and water. Certainly there is a parallel between paradise and gardens in Muslim thought, but the idea of the green garden oasis existed long before Islam, and it is highly unlikely that the very earliest Muslim gardens, that is, in the 7th and 8th centuries, were meant to represent paradise in symbolic terms. Rather, they were understood as places made productive by humankind, that's a Quranic mandate, and by the grace of God. As such, the garden collected all the best aspects of the working landscape, but produced it for human use and delight here on earth. In that way, the garden became the representation of humankind's place on earth. The ordinary water well by which water springs to the earth's surface became a fountain. The reservoir in which water is stored for use during the dry season became an ornamental pool. The mountain stream of water as it moves from source to destination became a lovely formal water channel. The stream's rushing flow was rendered as a textured water chute called a chadar. And the organization of agricultural fields into sunken plots that could be flooded on rotation for irrigation that was simplified into the classic four-part Chahar Bagh design that we see in the Court of the Lions in the Alhambra Palace in Spain. We don't know very much about the actual plants that were planted in these gardens because the botanical matter is long gone. The best source on gardens is Arabic and Persian agricultural manuals written sometimes a thousand years ago. And what these tell us is that the gardeners of that age relied on both first-hand experimentation, but also classical sources. This is a page from a medieval manuscript on botanical plants used for medicines, a copy of a Greek original by Dioscorides. The Greek text here describes the rose, and we see the shrub with its roots, pruned canes, leaves, and flowers in bud and full bloom. Next to the Greek label for the plant is its name written in Arabic. So here is a case of translated knowledge, produced in Greek for one audience, but then eagerly absorbed into the Arabic-speaking world. One of the reasons that the Islamic world excelled at science at such an early period is that they read, critiqued, and improved the classical texts on things like botany, geometry, objects, and astronomy. Pages from an Arabic translation of the same text show how the medicines were to be prepared. Here, the physician is reading from a book, presumably the manuscript itself, while his assistant prepares an antidote for spider bite crushing the ingredients with mortar and pestle. These examples of plants used for medicinal purposes reveal that gardens were developed for more than mere entertainment and beauty. The gardens could also serve as points of exchange for new plants and new knowledge about them. In other words, as botanical experimentation sites. The introduction of new and exotic plants was often a top-down system in which the ruler obtained the foreign plant and then disseminated it from his garden into the larger landscape. For example, there is the case of the fruit basket that was sent to the ruler of Islamic Spain from his aunt in Syria. And you can imagine, by the time the fruit basket arrived, the fruit was largely rotten. But a quick-witted member of the court took the seeds from that fruit, planted it in his own garden, produced trees, and when those trees, within a matter of years, had produced fruit, he brought the fruit and presented it in court to the ruler. And the sources, the chroniclers of the period tell us that from that moment on, that superior variety of pomegranate was grown throughout the Iberian Peninsula. In the Muslim world, a palace wasn't much of a palace unless it had gardens. In addition to the symbolic meaning of the garden as a microcosm of the ruler's territory and the cultivated landscape, the greenery and running fountains actually cooled the environment. The extreme heat of the arid environments where Muslim palaces were often built could be avoided by seeking shade inside thick-walled buildings and under tree canopies. But in the heat, there is nothing as pleasant as a spray of cool water. The water did actually lower the ambient temperature, and psychologically, the mere sound and sight of water is wonderfully refreshing. As an idea, the garden became so popular that it began to appear as a theme in the other arts. 
In the calligraphy art spot, we see that calligraphy and geometry and floral ornament were used in religious settings where figural imagery was avoided. There, floral imagery hints at the gardens of paradise. This prayer rug from 17th century Isfahan takes the form of a mihrab niche to orient the direction of the worshiper as he or she kneels on the carpet for daily prayer. At the top is an inscription that states the basic credo, there is no God but God. The frame is filled with a generously blooming lily. The plant points literally forward toward Mecca and symbolically upward toward the paradise that awaits the faithful. In the courts of the Ottomans of Turkey, Mughals of India, and Safavids of Iran, flowers became an important theme everywhere. They appear in tile work, such as here at the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul. They also appear in richly colored stone inlay, as in these column bases at the Agra Fort in Mughal India. The flowers were often rendered with extraordinary detail, capturing the fragile and ephemeral bloom of a tulip or chrysanthemum. Some of the keen interest in these kinds of floral representations may have been because treatises from Europe with detailed botanical prints had been imported by visiting European merchants. It was as if flowers not only filled the gardens, but spilled over onto the buildings, covering the walls and even the floors. There is even a type of rug known as a garden carpet in which not only the flowers, but the entire layout of the garden is reproduced. There are streams filled with fish and waterfowl that meet in an ornamental pool. It represents a variant of a chaharbag with the kind of strict geometry that we see more of in the geometry art spot. One can imagine the effect of such a rich carpet laid out on the floor inside a pavilion, yet imitating the vegetation beds, water channels, and even the birds of the garden outside, so that the interior and exterior spaces become almost indistinguishable. I said that the earliest gardens were unlikely to have been intended as metaphors for paradise, except in a, a very general sense. The exception, not surprisingly, are cemeteries. Here, the builder and caretaker naturally thought of a beautiful shady garden as paradisiac. And by that I mean both in that generic sense of just heavenly, but also in the specific sense of being an earthly reflection of the paradise that awaits the faithful. In time, that association of gardens with paradise became ubiquitous. We see this in the simplest of tombstones, where the image of a cypress suggests the immortality of the soul, both because the tree is evergreen and because it points upward. It also looks a bit like a prayer rug. Cemeteries make a clear connection between earthly and heavenly gardens. In the great Suleymaniye Mosque of Istanbul, outside the mosque's prayer hall is a lovely cemetery. The Sultan Suleiman and his wife Hurim are each buried in freestanding mausolea, but family members and followers are buried under gravestones, often decorated with floral imagery. Some of them are actually garden beds, planted with roses and irises that rebloom seasonally, a cycle of rebirth after death that evokes the rebirth of the soul of the deceased. Magnificent examples of tomb gardens survive from Mughal India, for example, the Taj Mahal. The grand imperial tomb stands at one end of an enormous garden divided into four quadrants by tree-lined water channels that meet at a rectangular pool. Under the great dome, the Queen Mumtaz Mahal lies buried, followed later by her husband, the Emperor Shah Jahan. The metaphor of the relationship between heaven and earth is made visible in the garden's flowing streams and shady trees. As the souls of the deceased rest in the gardens of paradise, so too their bodies rest in an earthly garden that mirrors paradise. When we think about Islamic gardens, you know, we, we think instantly about paradise, and to some extent they do represent paradise. They certainly come to represent paradise, but, but what does that mean, representing paradise? Is it the paradise of the Quran, in other words, something that we have to wait for, or is it a paradise that can be enjoyed here on earth? And for me, this is the most meaningful aspect of gardens, that they can express this yearning for something perfect here and now. So in their most profound sense, gardens are the way that human beings conceptualize their brief time and place on earth and the yearning for eternity.
Islamic Art Spots are a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys is a presentation of the National Endowment for the Humanities in cooperation with the American Library Association. Support for this program was provided by a grant from Carnegie Corporation of New York with additional support for art and media components from the Doris Duke Foundation for Islamic Art. To further explore the Islamic art spots and the Bridging Cultures Bookshelf Muslim Journeys, visit the Muslim Journeys website. Jennifer Caprell and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach at the Asia Society Texas Center. The project we work most closely together on is Family Day Eid. Uh, our first inaugural Family Day Eid was last year where we welcomed a thousand visitors and it was really spectacular because families of all different backgrounds and faiths came together to learn together, to explore, to build new connections and really I think live the mission that both the Islamic Art Society and Asia Society have of building that cross-cultural understanding and building a community of people that want to learn about each other and learn new things. Our introductory and advanced classes on Islamic arts are very popular among young students and adults, where students learn about calligraphy, arabesque, and geometric art and painting. Our Building Bridges Through Arts Library program is a month-long exhibition of Islamic arts which includes a workshop as well as an interactive discussion on Islamic arts. The program opens up dialogue and helps visitors understand Muslim culture and heritage. Through Islamic arts, we are building bridges between communities and making Houston a better place for all of us. Greetings, everyone, uh, and welcome to this uh, uh, panel discussion on uh, Seeking Solace in the Beautiful, the Spirit of Islamic Art. Uh, my name is Ali Asani, and I'm a professor at Harvard University who, uh, who works in the intersection between religion, literature, and the arts. And joining me in the panel discussion um, are Professor Fairchild Ruggles, from uh, Illinois University and, and Professor Farshid Imami from Rice University. So I'm going to start out this, uh, this event by sharing with you some of my ideas on the importance of art and aesthetics in the Islamic tradition. When one thinks about Islam, uh, many people don't connect Islam with the arts. However, uh, I would argue that Islam was a tradition that was born out of arts and aesthetics. And 
I would base my argument of the importance of art, beauty, aesthetics in Islam uh, in the Quran itself. So when people generally think about the Quran, uh, they really think about it as a book. However, I would argue that the Quran, when it was first revealed, was not a book, it was an experience. We know the story of the Quran, uh, the way in which it was revealed. The Prophet Muhammad was meditating in a cave and he heard a voice, Ikra, Ikra bismi rabbika, read, read or recite in the name of your Lord. That experience was overwhelming for him. Uh, and accounts tell us that he was so overwhelmed uh, at, as to what happened that he fled down the mountain, uh, Hira, he was in a cave on this mountain, he fled down the mountain and he went home. Uh, and there he is, his wife, Bibi Khadija, tried to uh, comfort him because he, he was just overwhelmed by this whole experience. This was the beginning on how this text emerged as, uh, as let something that was, that he heard and something that he experienced. It says that the experience was so overwhelming that his heart was pounding. These are what the descriptions say, that his heart was pounding. Uh, he just felt that somebody had embraced him very tightly. So again, a sense of experience and you know, generally the experience of being in awe, it was in the same of just being some sort of awe. In any case, he continued to have these revelations, these uh, um, verses that were, uh, that would come down to him. And as he started reciting what was being revealed to him, people would gather around him uh, at least this is what the Muslim accounts tell us, that people would gather around him and would be so amazed at the beauty of what he was reciting that some of them would weep and cry and, some, and they couldn't explain why they were weeping and why they were crying. And we see in the Quran itself uh, an expression of, of this where uh, it talks about you know, that God has sent out the most beautiful of all teachings, a scripture that is consistent and draws comparison and that causes the skin of those in awe of God to shiver, right? And their skins and their hearts soften at the mention of God. Now, this is a very interesting uh, way to think about the Quran as a text that was experienced, an oral text that was experienced, and a text that recognizes its impact on the listeners. You know, this idea of the skin to shiver, like almost getting goosebumps, and their skins and their hearts to soften. This idea of the aesthetic impact of the Quran, we find over and over again repeated in the early accounts of how the, most, the communities in Mecca responded to this revelation. So we have the very famous story of uh, Omar ibn Khattab, who later on became the second caliph of Islam, who at, at one point was very skeptical of, of the messages that the Prophet Muhammad was preaching, but he had heard about the power of this Quran but hadn't uh, from, you know, that it was a very powerful text to listen to, uh, but he was really afraid of the power that uh, the prophet Muhammad would accumulate around him because he was starting to gather followers. So he considered him to be really an enemy. And he had forbidden, for example, his sister to go to any of these Quran recitation sessions that were happening. And one of the accounts says that he heard that his sister had actually been attending one of these Quran recitation sessions or listening sessions, if you will, uh, secretly. And he decided to confront her. So he, uh, while she, 
in the middle of the night when she went into this uh, meeting place to hear a Quran recitation, he burst into this session and he heard this Quran. The story goes, he heard this Quran and he had never heard anything so beautiful that right there and then he started to weep and cry and he could finally comprehend what was the power of this text that he was trying to oppose. So this becomes his conversion moment, that conversion took place uh, by the, the very strength of the beauty of the text. And in fact, we find in early Islamic history, there was all this speculation going on as to what was the power of this text? Who exactly was the prophet? Prophet Muhammad, as he later on came to be known, was he a magician? Was he a poet? Uh, that were the two categories that the, somebody could be have such a power over words. He either has to be a magician or a poet. And why a poet? Because poets in Arab society were seen as being connected to jinns and spirits. So probably they people thought maybe some sort of a, a really um, amazing poet who's connected to a jinn or a spirit, and that makes his word powerful and has this impact on us. But the prophet Muhammad said, no, I'm neither a magician nor a poet, but I'm a prophet. And what is being revealed to me is not from some jinn, it is, it's a revelation from God. And you have um, people, you're challenging this notion that how do we know that this is divine? That this is actually coming from, from, from this God that you're speaking about. And we find in the Quran a challenge being thrown to people who doubted the, uh, the sacredness of the text, but also the beauty of this text by saying that if humans and jinns banded together and produced, tried to produce the like of this, they could never even produce something similar to this. Or some people saying, oh, you know, he, they say that he, meaning the prophet has fabricated it, fabricated the text and believe them not, tell them to produce a text as of, of similar text to this. So, the constantly there's a challenge put, put out to people who doubt the meaning of the text by saying, you produce something as beautiful as this. So the beauty of the text becomes something that is sign of its divine origin. And the challenge is that, that no human can produce something as beautiful as this. And this becomes the foundation of what I would call a theology of aesthetics and beauty in Islam, a theology that sometimes we don't pay too much attention to, but it's very much there at the heart of the tradition where aesthetics and beauty are seen as a manifestation of the divine in the world, listening to the Quranic text or Sama as it's called, is a way in which you commune with the divine in, and it's a moving experience and the text itself was not just to be listened to, was not just an oral text, because eventually when the text gets written down, the visual text also had to be just as beautiful and inspiring. And this is where the arts of calligraphy coming and the arts of inscribing the sacred work in as beautiful a form as possible. Um, and this gives rise to this very interesting, powerful statement, a hadith of the prophet, God is beautiful and loves beauty. And that in his essence, God is beautiful. His names, his attributes, they all reflect the beauty of God. And so you find over and over in the Quran, this reference to looking at the you know, looking for the face of God that surrounds us and that face of God being manifest in the beauty, sometimes nature, the signs of God are seen in nature. His names are beautiful. So you get this idea of beauty and the sacred being fused. And of course, 
the wonderful art of calligraphy tries to fuse some of this. I'm just going to show just a couple of examples. This is a beautiful Kufi Quran on blue, on blue vellum. And you can see here, you know, these words were not actually meant to be read because, you know, they're highly stylized. They were meant to be uh, appreciated. The beauty and the aesthetics of the words and the way they flow was meant to be uh, appreciate it. So in a way, pointing to the fact that this is a text that has to be experienced. And then, of course, we have the incorporation of this calligraphy into various ar um, architectural forms, like, you know, here you have an example of calligraphy in a, in a beautifully and, you know, in the, in the decor of a mosque in Iran. Um, and you get all kinds of objects, like this one is, uh, is has in its, uh, it's a filter of a jar uh, in which water is poured through, but in the filter, and this is highly magnified, you see these Quranic verses which, which read that he gave them uh, something pure to drink, meaning God gave them something pure to drink. And it's beautifully inscribed into the into the filter itself so that as the water is going through, it is also going to that sacred word. And the idea is maybe you're purifying the word itself. And then I'm just going to show another example as to how this beauty gets expressed in different ways. Um, this is a piece of, this is a close up piece of textile and all these little uh, scribblings, just, this is all calligraphy here. And what this belongs to is this wonderful Quran core coat. It's a jacket with the entire Quran on it. And it was meant as a talisman to ward off evil. So when the, when, the, when, the, when the caliph went into war, he would wear it under his armor or even maybe for a few minutes as a way of protecting himself, but as a work, as a, as a work of beauty again, it's not just the talismanic, the way to ward off evil, but it's a beautiful piece that's trying to reflect also the beauty of the Quran. So uh, one last sort of point that I would, I would mention here in, the, in talking about beauty and the sacred in Islam, what are human beings supposed to do with this beauty? And for this, I want to point out this, uh, the importance of this word Ihsan which means to do beautiful things or to do things in a more perfect and excellent manner. So it's very often said that there are three dimensions to Islam, the religion, Islam, the act of submission, Iman, the act of faith and Ihsan. And Ihsan, the word Ihsan comes from the Arabic word for beauty and elegance, Hosan. And Musan is somebody who does what is beautiful. And being a Mosin is reaching sort of the highest stages of faith. So I think in, in essence, this is saying is that if God is beautiful, human beings have to try to be as beautiful as possible in a way that they are actually reflecting God's beauty. So by this idea that Beauty is a sign of God and all beauty, even that of human beings as persons, uh, beautiful persons is actually also a sign of faith. So I'm going to stop my comments here and um, turn it over um, to uh, Professor uh, Fairchild Ruggles. Hello, I'm Dee, Dee Dee Fairchild Ruggles, and I'm very pleased to be here with this distinguished panel of experts in the art and culture of the Islamic world. My own area is in the area of gardens and landscape, and that's what I'll be talking about with you. These days, many of us are finding surprising pleasure in walking outdoors, meeting friends outdoors, enjoying the sun, the air, the view of nature. But while this may be a new or renewed experience for many of us, the understanding of the garden as a place of pleasure and healing is at the heart of an Islamic garden. Islamic gardens and landscapes are sensory environments. We love them for the color and texture of the plants and flowers grown there, 
but they also offer other sensory experiences such as sound. You can almost hear the water spray here at a garden in Iran. And if we look at this set of images, you can almost hear the vigor of the water as it pours over this chadar in a garden. We can imagine the sound of the birds that we see in this manuscript, this detail of a manuscript illustration. And of course, we can imagine the music that might be played by human beings in gardens. In fact, we have images from manuscripts that show musical soirees occurring out in the garden. In this case, an enclosed courtyard garden with vegetation and the musicians and singers seated directly on the ground. In addition to sound, we can appreciate gardens for the tactile sense. Here at the Generalife, which is the palace right next to the Alhambra, the handrails on either side of this downward sloping series of stairs, the handrails invite us to dip our fingers into the cool water. And we're looking up that same set of stairs here. And you can see the water rushing down those handrails. And of course, the very sight of flowers often impels many of us, certainly me, to lean forward and touch the bloom and perhaps to pick the fruit. In touching the leaves of herbs such as mint or rosemary, we walk away with the scent of its pungent oil. So we go from tactility to scent. Scent is the most elusive, yet I think the most profoundly important of the senses. The fragrance of the rose intensifies as we get closer to it. It invites us to draw near, to immerse ourselves in the garden. In other words, referring to Dr. Asani's uh, introduction, his, his um, talk, it is a, a body experience. It is a kind of um, experiential way of being in the garden. The difference between looking at a garden, which is what we're doing now, we're not actually in this garden, we're just looking at a, a picture of it. So the difference between looking and being in one is that one is purely visual, while the other is a bodily experience in which all the senses are engaged. And those senses are important because they tie us to the living world. So think about this. To see something, we are always at a distance from it. The thing we look at is beyond ourselves. It's outside of ourselves, out there in the material world, away from us. We can see the world, but we cannot really see ourselves, not completely anyway. But to smell something, we instinctively lean toward it and draw the scent into our noses, literally inhaling it so that it becomes part of us. It becomes part of our very bodies. And this is the power of the garden. We don't simply look at it, we experience it in a visceral way. The garden is an extraordinarily important art form because through the garden, we express our relationship to the earth, to God's creation. In the Islamic world, the garden is a deeply meaningful form of artistic expression. And it's possible that the garden gains so much significance in Islam because the task of making a garden in the hot, dry environments where Islam begins was so very difficult. Even in, yet even in the area, in the era before modern mechanizations, farmers managed to collect enough water to transform even a desert environment into a productive landscape. And you see that here, this little oasis in which out of, you know, just sand, emerges palm trees. And that very struggle, that act of transformation, is meaningful because it fulfills the mandate in the Quran to serve as stewards of the earth. In a sense, we are asked to tend the earth as though it were a garden. In the Quran, we read, he subjugated for you whatsoever is in the heavens and the earth, each and everything. In other words, God makes creation and humans tend it. In many ways, what makes a garden beautiful is not its natural attributes, but its very artificiality, that sign of human presence. So for example, looking at this landscape in Iran, it's because we work so hard to make that garden, that cultivated, transformed space, that it appears as something different and better than the surrounding landscape. In this walled garden in Iran, divided into four parts, it stands out from the surrounding landscape and the walls enclose plots 
that contain water. That's the thing that differentiates the enclosed area from everything around it. And the water is piped in through an underground conduit called a canat. It is the enclosure's removal from the rest of the land that makes it special. It is the fact that it is not natural that makes it special. So too, we could look at this aerial view of a canat as it fans out into the landscape. And you can see the water coming on the, down from the mountains and spreading out in this fan-like manner. And then the plots made by farmers in which each farmer has aligned his plot to coordinate with the path of the water, trying to extract as much water as possible from that very precious water course. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why I have not yet mentioned the Chahar Bagh, a classic garden divided into two quadrants with symbolism that ranges from the agricultural to the paradisiac. We see a particularly wonderful example of a Chahar Bagh at the Alhambra's Court of the Lions in Spain. In the enclosed courtyard, four water channels run toward the center of the garden, meeting at the lion's fountain. The vegetation is missing, largely because no one really knows what kind of vegetation might have been planted there. In fact, many modern historians think that its only planting was a few orange trees. In the tomb of Humayun, we see another example of a four-part garden, with the tomb at the center and the garden around it divided into quadrants that, if you know the garden at all, you know are divided yet again into subunits. The most common explanation for the Chahar Bagh with its four-part layout is that it is intended to mirror paradise as described in the Quran. The Quran in several different verses describes paradise as having four streams of water, fresh milk, wine, and honey, and also having fruits of every kind and shade. This describes a garden with four channels perhaps arranged cross-axially to form a Chahar Bagh. However, this verse does not describe all Islamic gardens. Some earthly gardens were clearly meant to mirror paradise. For example, the tomb garden that we've seen here again, where the body of the deceased emperor rests in a garden as his soul rests in paradise. But not all gardens follow this model. In fact, the classic Chahar Bagh that we think of, typically when we think of Islamic gardens, seems to appear mostly in later periods. This tomb of Humayun dates to the 16th century. The great garden estates of Kashmir date to the 17th century. And I'm just showing you the plan so you can see that this is a very rectilinear cross axial Chahar Bagh type. Or the, the Taj Mahal, Another kind of classic example of a Chahar Bagh dates to the 17th century. These are relatively modern sites. If we look throughout all times and places in the Islamic world, as I did in my book on Islamic gardens, we see relatively few gardens divided into four parts by channel. For example, if we go to the oldest continuously planted garden in Islam, we're at the Great Mosque of Cordoba starting in 786, and yet the mosque courtyard was not a four-part arrangement, but was organized in rows of trees. The trees were irrigated by water channels, but the layout is not cross-axial. This does not bear resemblance to paradise as described in the Quran, despite the fact that it is a mosque setting. Instead, it hearkens to the world of 8th century Islam, the time that the mosque was built where farmers were busily fulfilling that other Quranic mandate to serve as good stewards of the earth given to them by God. The mosque courtyard is an orchard and a productive orchard yielding fruit. In this sense of productivity, it seems inspired by a different Quran verse that describes the abundance of the earth. It is he who sends down water from the skies and brings out of it everything that grows the green foliage, grain lying close, date palm trees, gardens of grapes, olives, pomegranates. This is a modern translation. For myself, I find all Islamic gardens beautiful, whether or not they belong to the family of the great four-part Chahar Bagh, or whether it's simply a farmer's agricultural plot. 
Some of the gardens that I like best are those where we see people performing their role as stewards, transforming the land and making it productive. Here, a mountain landscape made suitable for farming by creating stepped terraces. Each level holds a cultivated plot where water is retained on the level surface long enough to soak into the soil. It is the more humble aspects of these gardens that I love best. Those where we express, where we express our relationship to the earth that sustains us in very simple terms. In Iran, we see a channel that irrigates trees, allowing them to grow in an otherwise desert landscape. In Cyprus, at the military border that divides the north and south sides of the island, a scar in the city's architectural fabric is softened by a climbing vine and a potted plant, a sign of hope, perhaps. At an Egyptian oasis, water channels divide the land into plots with deep furrows, all of it designed to maximize a limited supply of water and to enable the farmer to grow food. In Kashan, at a cafe with a pipe dripping into a crudely built basin, a garden is made. In Fez, a brick path divides the garden, allowing us to enter into it. In this Ottoman cemetery in Rhodes, the fact that the garden is untended tells us that the Muslim population is gone. Its neglect contrasts with the much better tended cemetery in Istanbul. This one belongs to an emperor's tomb. These days, I'm spending a lot of time not simply looking at my own garden, but in it, gathering safely outdoors with friends, eight feet apart, wearing those masks that none of us likes, but that we must wear to protect the people around us. In this sometimes isolating, lonely, somewhat confusing time, I'm reading good books, listening to music, and seeking solace in my own garden. Hello, uh, my name is Farshid Imami, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Art History at Rice University. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this panel with Dr. Asani and Dr. Ruggles, and thank you for the kind invitation. I'm truly honored. Um, so today I'm going to speak to you about poetry and architecture in Muslim cultures. Um, so poetry and architecture are arguably among the most acclaimed cultural achievements of Muslim cultures across time and space. As Dr. Asani showed us, calligraphy was a major form of ornamentation in Islamic architecture. And along with verses from the Quran, poetic inscriptions also graced the works of architecture across the Islamic world. Um, so today I'm going to show you three examples from different parts of the Islamic world where poetry and poetic inscriptions played a major role in architectural ornamentation. And then I'll reflect, reflect a little bit about um, how uh, these poems um, express notions of beauty and convey the spirit of beauty in Islamic art. So the first example and probably the most uh, famous Islamic buildings which has poetic inscriptions is the Alhambra and and Dr. Ruggles and, um, and um, many other uh, scholars have written about it. And um, I'm, uh, I'm, I'll just make a very few quick points about the Alhambra here. Uh, so Alhambra is, uh, is a palace of the Nasrid rulers. Is it, it's the uh, last uh, Muslim dynasty to rule in Iberia, uh, the, Pen the Iberian Peninsula, which is what is today Portugal and Spain, in a small part of the, in the south of the peninsula. It is probably the palace complex at the Alhambra, the most intricate building of the world, and that wouldn't be an exaggeration. Many people agree with that assessment, and it's richly decorated in carved stucco with vegetal forms and, uh, and inscriptions. Um, and we looked at the uh, Court of the Lions in Dr. Ruggles' uh, presentation with, with the four uh, water channels that intersect at the uh, fountain at the center. And uh, the detailed, uh, intricate um, carved stucco mukarna ceilings of the complex. But the Alhambra is also known for its poetic inscriptions, and 
These are poems that were composed specifically for the building by court poets, and they are inscribed on the walls. And um, as this one that you see here, which is the uh, Hall of the Two Sisters in the Court of the Lions, in the Palace of the Lions. These are graceful poetic inscriptions um, in a stucco, in a background of vegetal uh, decoration. And these are exactly at eye level. So they were meant to be read and appreciated. And this also speaks to the idea of embodied experience. These poems are meant to be part of the experience of the building and um, they are so central to the experience of the Alhambra. And many of them are composed in the first person voice, which means that we have a speaking building, building that is speaking directly to its audiences. So I'm just going to go over some of the inscriptions in the uh, Kumaras Palace. Kumaras Palace is one of the two major components of the palace complex in the Alhambra. This is also known as the Court of the Myrtles. And here we are looking at the Kumaras Tower, which was the main uh, reception hall of the palace complex. So this is a square room with alcoves that overlook the landscape outside in the city of Granada. And uh, the Kumaras Tower has um, a range of inscriptions, both Quranic and poetic inscriptions. And uh, these are covering the walls, the stucco walls uh, of the Kumaras Palace and the, and, the, and the reception hall itself is covered by a wooden ceiling with geometric patterns in, uh, with patterns that are formed of uh, uh, star and polygons. So the inscriptions include uh, uh, verses from the Quran, uh, the Surah Al-Falak, which is around the arch uh, made at the main entrance, Surah Al-Mulk, uh, the Dominion, uh, which is inscribed beneath the dome. And there are also poems inside the central alcove on the lower level of the walls. So there is a clear uh, spatial hierarchy in where inscriptions appear. So the Quranic verses are high on walls and um, human created poems are inscribed on the lower parts of the wall. So there's a uh, spatial dialogue between the human voice and the voice of, of, of God. The uh, Quranic inscription from the Surah al mulk reads, blessed is he who is, whose hand is dominion and he is all of our things competent. He who created death and life to test you as, you, as to which of you is best indeed. And he is the exalted in, my, in might, the forgiving. And who created seven heavens in layers. You do not see in the creation of the most merciful any imperfection. So return your vision to the sky. Do you see any fissure? So this has been interpreted as a reference to the um, geometric patterns that we see on the ceiling. And some scholars read it as, as a representation of the seven layers of, of the heaven as it's described uh, in the Quranic verses. The poetic inscription, which is composed in the first uh, uh, uh, person voice, appears on the alcove and the lower parts of the wall and its response to the Quranic inscription. I read some of the uh, lines of uh, the first lines. You received from me morning and evening solutions of blessing, prosperity, happiness, and friendship. This is the light dome and we are its daughter. Yet I have distinction and glory in my family. I am the heart amidst other parts of the body, for it is the heart that resides this that that resides this strength and of soul and spirit. So here the uh, uh, verses are also referring to the Quranic verses on the on the on, on the top of the wall uh, in be, below the dome and establish a relationship between the world of humans and the world of uh, divine. My second example comes from the Shahis in the complex in uh, Samarkand uh, in Uzbekistan today. Uh, Shahis in the, which literally means living king, is a major shrine in the city of Samarkand and uh, attributed to the cousin of the Prophet Muhammad, Qusam ibn Abbas. Uh, 
During the 15th, 14th and 15th century centuries, a series of funerary buildings were built here by members of the Timurid dynasty. And these tombs were arranged along a narrow 200 meter long alley that leads to the shrine. Most of these uh, buildings are decorated with glazed uh, ceramic tiles, which include, again, vegetal forms and inscriptions. Um, one of the earliest and best preserved monuments of the Shah Zenda complex is the mausoleum of Shah de Mulk Aga. Uh, she was a, a daughter of a sister of Timur, and uh, the building is richly decorated with exquisite glazed ceramic tiles, both inside and outside. Here we see on the screen the uh, recessed, recessed arch at the entrance to the tomb cham chamber, which is decorated with a Mokarnas uh, uh, half dome. And Mokarnas refers to these uh, stalactites, these uh, small niches that are stacked on top of one another to create this uh, exquisite uh, half dome here. The building, uh, the uh, mausoleum is the work of two masters named Zainadin and Shamsaddin, who put their signatures on the building. Uh, and uh, the building is also decorated with poetic inscriptions. So below the Mokarnas uh, the dome, there is, a, there is an inscription band executed in white cursive script on a blue background. And this is a poem in Persian that reads, this ceiling covered in Mokarnas and this ornate arch are reminiscent of the art of beauty, Zain or Zainatin. Every ornament and art that you see in the world exists only by the grace of the creator, the almighty. So it seems that there is a pun in the use of the word Zain. Zain means beauty, so the art of beauty, but also Zain could also be a reference to Zain din the artist who created uh, this work. So this is both, a, both an expression of humility in, in the face of the creations of God, but also a signature of authorship, a sign of authorship and, a, and the status and the great work, a, a, a reminder to viewers that this is a work of, a, of an artisan named Zainatin. My last example is the uh, Maidane Nakhshe Jahan, image of the world square in Safavid, Iran, built in the 17th century. This is a huge complex uh, surrounded by shopping arcades and uh, monumental mosques and uh, palaces and commercial complexes. But even this huge complex has its own poetic inscription that gives a voice to its designer and engages the viewers in a different way. Um, so the poetic inscriptions appear on the portal to the Caesarea, which is located on the north side of the complex and they are on the side walls. And these are two verses uh, from the Golestan Rose Garden by the 13th century poet Sadi. So these are executed in what is known as square Kufic inscription. This is a form of uh, inscription that is particularly used for architectural decoration. It's a grid-like uh, form of a script and, um, and that was very common in this period for architectural decoration. So, and it's usually, and th uh, these inscriptions typically read clockwise. Uh, so you need to turn your head um, 360 degrees to read the entire, uh, entire poem. And it starts from here. So there's are two verses from the uh, Golestan. One verse is on the Eastern side and the, the second verse in the, and the, uh, East, Western side. So there is a kind of dialogue in, in architectural space here. Um, so the poem reads, the wish is that a trace of us survives as I see no permanence in existence. One day maybe a sage mercifully prays on behalf of the poor. 
so these are, you know, very famous verses from the early, from the introduction to the Golestan of Saadi. And this was an important text, maybe after the Quran, uh, the second text that in Persian speaking lands, a person would learn to be literate would be the, would be the Golestan by Saadi. So this is evoking, there are two verses, but literate uh, audiences would have been able to uh, imagine and, and remember the whole uh, the whole verse. So by adding these uh, uh, poem, this poem to to the work of architecture, the the designer uh, uh, was trying to elevate the status of his work again in a in a spirit of humility. Um, and sort of a drawing a comparison between a work of architecture and a work of uh, literature. Um, so these uh, three examples that we looked at from across the Islamic world gives us a sense of uh, how poetic inscriptions were used in works of architecture. So poetry gives voice to buildings, to uh, monuments, and it adds uh, a layer, a different layer, a layer of beauty that that works with uh, um, uh, divine words and word works verses from the Quran to create this kind of embodied experience and uh, of of of architecture and beauty. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for those uh, those remarks, uh, Prashid and. Uh, now have a time just for us to reflect on what we've heard. Uh, uh, I'm just going to say a few words, you know, in terms of reflecting on your presentations and where these conversations um, lead us to. Uh, I started talking about, you know, at the heart of Islam, we have the Quran and the Quran is embedded in this language of beauty and aesthetics and that the word, the sound, that the, you know, that the sacred becomes manifest in this beautiful sound. And then at the heart, and then from this beautiful sound emerge many other things. I noticed that um, both of you mentioned in, uh, in your presentations, Quranic verses that, you know, again, emphasize beauties, beauties of paradise, gardens, beauty, um, uh, beauties of things that God has created, uh, nature, you know, that in nature are the signs of God. And I think there is in, in here a kind of way in which when we think about the religious experience, I would say, again, I wanted to emphasize the experience, that the religious experience in Islam is multisensory. That, you know, how do you experience the divine? How do you experience the, sin, you know, the sacred? And it's not just by reading a book. It's not just by reading a work of theology or philosophy, because that's all just, I would say, discursive knowledge. It's knowledge for the mind. It's intellectual. But you can't really experience the sacred. But you can experience the sacred when, for example, you see a, a beautiful piece of architecture. You see the, you know, the poetry, if you, if you are able to uh, decipher the poetry and think about its meaning. And even more important, in some of these cases, as uh, uh, Professor Ruggles, as you pointed out, that sometimes these gardens, that are these beautiful gardens, are also sites of poetry performance and music performances. So they're, they're multi-sensory in so many different ways. But I can think about, you know, this idea of, you know, gardens and beauty that, that surround us you know, it's, it's a theme that, that the Quran emphasizes over and over again, that how can you not believe in God when the signs of God are around you? That why don't you experience the divine? Because, you know, in the divine, you know, all this beauty that you see in the, in the world around you is just a reflection of divine beauty. And it's just human beings try to capture some of that beauty. But ultimately, you know, it's just the shadow of the shadow and the shadow of the ultimate beauty. So, I mean, these were some thoughts that came to my mind as I was listening to both of your presentations, but I'll turn it over to whoever wants to sort of respond to that. I'll, I'll respond. Um, I was thinking as I listened to both of your presentations 
um, how uh, sort of gracefully you you leapt from one medium to another, and and how this is actually invited by the um, by the culture itself. So the Quran, for example, is both something that we read, but also something that we hear. That is almost in some respects chanted. The recitation is a is a formal way of of speaking. And at the Alhambra, the beautiful Mukarnas, it's called the Hall of the Two Sisters, is of course also a place where we think music was played. And we know that poetry was recited there, that the poems on the walls start in many cases being recited. And if chosen by the Sultan would then be actually applied in stucco to the walls. So that multi-sensory is also a kind of multi-medium um, I guess what I'm saying is we sometimes forget that the arts are constantly interacting with each other. And if I may add a quick point that I, I definitely agree and uh, the more I study and ponder in medieval Islamic art, I see that Muslim artists and architects were very consciously uh, deploying and patrons these a multi-sensory experience. It seems that the beauty of visual forms had to be complemented by an, in a multi-sensory uh, experience, whether it's, you know, hearing the poetry, hearing the Quranic verses, or the uh, olfactory experience and other multi-sensory experiences. There were, this was not, a, the addition of poetry is not an accidental addition. It's very central to the culture and to creating that kind of uh, embodied experience that is necessary to complement visual experience. And the recitation of poetry is also a performance. It's, it's even more than sound, it's also, and it's and more than architecture, it's also the body standing. Even the, the delivery of the, of the sermon in the mosque is a is embodied experience in that you have to stand above the congregation in order to project your voice. So uh, it's, it's all of those things together. Yeah. yeah, I think this uh, this conversation actually reminds us uh, uh, to think about religion, uh, not just as dogmas and doctrines and theology and rituals and so on. There's this whole other aspect to religion uh, or religious experience, I would say, and it reminds us of the centrality of the arts. You know, I think the visual arts, the sound arts. Um, the uh, poetic arts or literary arts, uh, and and then the and the way they interact with each other, this different art form, to the experience of being Muslim, and uh, and you can see definitely the artists who are involved in shaping this, or the, whether it's in landscape or the buildings and so on, they're very conscious of this, that this is really part of the heritage, of uh, of of not just. They, not just the, you know, the dynasties that, that created these, these beautiful pieces, because many of these are artworks that have been patronized by powerful rulers, but they are also things that ordinary people can just enjoy and connect with the sacred in, in very interesting ways. And I hope it gives us a whole different sort of insight into uh, the centrality of the arts for, in fact, the Muslim experience. I remember, and I think this is the, sort of the last thing I wanted to say, and then you can, you know, I was once having a conversation with, uh, at a university with, with, uh, with an audience and talking about the arts, and uh, one person made the remark, oh, the arts are nice, you know, but they're like the icing on the cake. You know, they're not the real thing. And my response was to say, no, the arts are the cake and mm -hmm. everything else, the theology, the law, the philosophy, that's all the icing. But if you really want to understand what Islam is about, it's really about these arts in their various forms that it's meant to be experienced. And that's where I think the power of the tradition lies and its appeal to people around the world. If I may respond to part of uh, your statement, so what I really like about especially the two poems in Samarkand and in Isfahan 
is that they are, we can hear the voice of artisans. So although the mausoleum was commissioned by a powerful Timurid princess, the poem, I think, is the voice of the artisan. And it's how he understands his creation. And even the poem by Saadi in the Maidan in Esfahan is also an, a statement on the part of the, of the uh, architect. Uh, so some of these uh, little, it might be a small addition, but it reveals a lot about the nature of uh, art, artistic creation in Muslim cultures, especially in this period. That voice of the artisan, um, you know, it, eternity is a very hard thing to conceptualize. I just don't know what it is. But when I think of a poet whose words are still speaking to me, even when the poet has been gone these 400 years, that's the moment when I suddenly start to have a small glimmer of understanding of what eternity means, you know, to exist beyond your, yourself. Um, and we see that in the arts. It's in the arts that these artists continue to speak to us, the poets continue to speak to us, even the patrons, you know, in having it possible, continue to affect us. Yeah, so with that, I think we'll, um, we'll end our conversation. It's been so wonderful to uh, be part of this uh, panel and this conversation with the both of you. So thank you so much for uh, joining us. Wow, this was really an inspiring and thought-provoking discussion. Thank you so much, Dr. Asani, Dr. Ruggles, and Professor Imami for your precious time and great insight about seeking solace and the beautiful spirit of Islamic art through nature, inscriptions, architecture, and poetry. Special thanks to Dr. Asani for coordinating and moderating this discussion. On behalf of the Islamic Art Society and board members, I would like to extend our heartfelt gratitude to you all. Thank you so much. Oh, <laughs>